Welcome to the Justice Committee's 12th meeting of 2000 and 2019. We have apologies from Shona Robson and welcome back to the committee, Bill Kidd, who's substituting. Agenda item one is an evidence session on an affirmative instrument, the Justice of the Peace Court, Sheriff of, Sheriffdom of Strathclyde and Friesen Galloway, etc. Amendment Order, 2019 draft. And I welcome Hamza Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Walter Drummond Murray, Courts Tribunal Policy Officer, and Joanne Tinto, Director of Legal Legal services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper one, which is note by the clerk, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening <coughs> statement on the instrument. Thank you and good morning, uh, convener and committee. The order before the committee today delivers the relocation of the JP Court in Coatbridge to a new facility a mile and a half away in Airdrie. The building in Coatbridge is no longer suitable uh, and one response to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service consultation described it as uh, and I quote, a building that has had its best days in the last century, uh, end quote. The proposed new facility in Airdrie will provide a modern new building that will offer a far better experience for both court users uh, and staff. The new building is across the road from the existing Sheriff Court in Airdrie and offers the opportunity for Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to deliver more efficiently as the same group of staff support both courts uh, and suffer some inconvenience in shuttling between buildings. Uh, additionally, there is a small saving of £11,000 a year uh, in reduced rent rates and service charge. Uh, no posts will be lost as a result of the relocation. <coughs> Although parliamentary approval is required, I view this as a predominantly operational matter and decision for Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service so they can make the most efficient use of resources. Uh, the proposal enjoys the support of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service Board uh, and the Lord President and I'm happy to lend my support and bring it forward to Parliament for consideration. Do members have any <coughs> comments or questions? Fulton McGregor. Hey, thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. It's uh, MSP for Coatbridge and Chrysan, uh, where the, the, the court is located. Um, <laughs> I think you would expect me to, to ask a, a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm, the, the, under the um, a quote we've got here in the papers uh, for the committee, there's a, there's an aspect that says, while the statutory obligations require a high level of consultation and consideration, in this case the proposal is fairly modest and entails moving Coatbridge Justice of the Peace 1.4 miles. What I, I can understand that, and I think that it's, um, it's, it's based on uh, sound evidence, and I've not had a lot of rep representation on the issue, but can I ask what consultation was undertaken, what the level of consultation was? Yeah, again, it would be for um, the Scottish Court Tribunal Service to, to answer uh, more uh, widely. But uh, they did do a consultation, as, as you mentioned, a number of people uh, and organisations, I should say, uh, fed into that consultation. To give you some reassurance as local members, I would expect that you would want uh, a number of factors were also put, uh, taken into consideration. So, uh, you know, from previous experience of court closures or court relocations, um, they decided to look at things like the transport links. So they know the transport links between Coatbridge uh, and Airdrie. There are transport links both in terms of the bus and the train. Uh, they took into account what the effect would be in terms of court business uh, on Airdrie Sheriff Court if that court business was moved from Coatbridge so that there wasn't delays to your constituents if they were having to, 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 to go through JP court business. Um, so all, all these factors were, were considered, and as you say, there, there, there was, a, there was a, a number of responses, as you say, largely from um, um, organisations, but it's probably worth pointing out that one of the organisations that did give input was Victim Support Scotland, so again, potential victims uh, that, that may well be constituents uh, of yours, uh, they, they, they were representing uh, them. So, um, you know, universal support in the consultation uh, and a fair number of factors also considered uh, as part of the conversation uh, to, to, to relocate. Yeah, uh, can I follow a supplementary yeah. uh, Thanks for that uh, response, Cabinet Secretary. And I, I, I mean, reading over the proposals, I'm in, um, in general uh, agreement with them. There's, there's no doubt that where the court's situated in Coatbridge, it's very close to Airdrie. Um, I'm actually surprised it's, it's, it's 1.4 miles. It's, I actually would have uh, guessed less. So I don't, I don't think the impact there would be massive. And I also agree with the, uh, uh, you know, the condition of the building. Actually, I grew up in the street adjacent to the, to the actual court. So I know, I know well about the building. It's a, 
a historic landmark, but I think in terms of a uh, modern functioning, it's as a um, as offices as, as, as in a court, it's, it's probably not the best. Um, you mentioned there though the impact on Airdrie. Airdrie is a very busy sheriff court. Um, court Bridge Justice, the, the peace court, is very busy. Did you get any um, figures as such about what the impact would actually be? That a that was, pretty busy court at Airdrie. Yes, I mean it was it was absolutely part of the consideration for the Scottish Courts uh, and Tribunal Service. SCTS said that they're very confident uh, that there will be no adverse uh, effect upon performance at the Sheriff Court. Uh, in fact, the new facility uh, provides a new provision for vulnerable witnesses that will be available for cases in the Sheriff Court as well. So actually, the new facility helps uh, with some of the court business in Airdrie Sheriff Court as well as uh, the relocated work from the JP Court. Uh, in Coat Bridge uh, as well, so um, you know, uh, no no adverse effect on performance uh, is foreseen at all. But clearly, that was part of the consideration uh, and conversation that SCTS took forward. And a final question: There's not any anticipated um, adverse effect on staff. Are, are all staff expected to to move to the new premises? Quite the opposite. Um, some of the staff were experiencing inconvenience. I know it's only 1.4 miles, but uh, you can imagine having shuttled between those two buildings. Um, uh, actually, the, 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 the new facility being adjacent to the, the Sheriff Court is very, very handy for the staff. And, and as I mentioned in my speaking note, there's uh, no, no job losses anticipated because of the move. Yeah. I'll only add as a, a, a member for Central Scotland, a native of Court Bridge, I'm very aware this is a very old building and therefore the move to a, a new and better facility is welcome. I certainly haven't had any um, adverse comments to, to um, oppose that move. Um, if there are no other comments from members, we move to agenda item two, which is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee as considered and reported on the instrument and had no comments on it. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for a formal debate if that's necessary. The motion is motion 16769 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Justice of the Peace Court, Sheriffdom of South, Strathclyde, Drumfries and Galloway, etc., Amendment Order 2019 Draft be approved. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion. Moved. Moved. Um, do members have any further comments? No. Um, I put the question, therefore, that motion 16769 in the name of Ash Denham be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. That concludes consideration of the instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Eight. Is the committee content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft of the report? Thank you. So it only remains me, for me to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending and suspend briefly to allow for a change of officials. Agenda item three is continued consideration of the management of Offenders Scotland Bill at stage two. I refer members to their copy of the bill and to the marshalled list of amendments and groupings for this item. And I welcome back Hamza Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials to the meeting. Um, just for the avoidance of bout, officials are here to assist Cabinet Secretary during this stage two debate. They're not permitted to participate in the debate and for this reason, um, they don't have any nameplates. Um, we'll be joined at various parts of the meeting today by other members who have lodged amendments, and I welcome Lewis MacDonald, who's already in situ. 
We now um, begin our consideration of these amendments, and I call Amendment 93 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 104. Amendment 93 preempts Amendments 54 and 55 in the group, Part 1, Terminology Relevant Person. If Amendment 93 is agreed to, I cannot call amendments 54 and 55. Cabinet Secretary to move 93 and speak to both amendments in the group. Um, I move Amendment uh, 93 in my name. Uh, amendments 93 uh, and 104 are grouped as minor technical changes required as a result of Amendment 118, uh, which in turn extends the Scottish Minister's power to recall a prisoner from HDC. Uh, amendment 118 and sets a new subsection into section 42 of the bill, amending section 17A of the Prisoner and Criminal Proceedings Act 1993, to provide that a prisoner can be recalled from HDC if the Scottish ministers consider it to be expedient in the public interest. Uh, amendments 93, uh, amendment 93 and, and 104 are tidy up references to section 17A of the 1993 Act and other parts of the bill. And I move it in, in my name. Do members have any comments? In that case, the question is that Amendment 93 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. No, we're not all agreed. Uh, not all agreed. Uh, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Seven in favour, two against. Amendment 93 is agreed. Um, the question is that section 13 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call amendment 132 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, already debated with amendment 73, which I will not move. The question is therefore, oh yeah, call amendment 56 in the name of Daniel Johnson, Johnson already debated with amendment to Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. no. We are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. 7-2, um, Amendment 56 is agreed. Call Amendment 57 in the name of Daniel John Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 57 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. 7-2, yeah. uh, therefore, Amendment 57 is agreed. Call Amendment 94 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 84 for Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 95 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 84. I remind members that if Amendment 95 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 58, which is a preemption. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that... Oh, yeah. I call Amendment 96 to 98 on the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 96 to 98 on block. Uh, moved on block. Uh -huh. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 96 to 98? No. Oh. The question is, therefore, that Amendments 96 to 98 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 99 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 84. I remind members that if Amendment 99 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 59, which is a preemption. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that um, Amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, yeah. Call Amendment 60 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment to Daniel Johnson to move or not move. Uh, move. Move. The question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. Um, those in favour, please show. 
Those against? 7-2, at which means Amendment 60 is agreed. Call Amendment 100 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 84. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. Um, the question is that Section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 101 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 101. Um, to move and I will speak to Amendment 101 uh, in a second. Uh, I'm getting there. I promise you can be there. Uh, Amendment 101 changes the Section 9 power in the Bill, which enables Scottish Ministers to make regulations uh, in relation to use of devices and information to make them subject to the affirmative procedures. Uh, this was one of the recommendations from the Justice Committee in their Stage 1 report. Uh, the regulation making power in Section 9 empowers Scottish Ministers to make provisions about the use of information obtained through monitoring, uh, expressly includes placing restrictions on the use of sharing of that information. Scottish Ministers will be able to use this power to ensure that data is collected, retained, used and destroyed in accordance with the data protection law. Uh, we've listened carefully to the Justice Committee's views on the use of devices and information, and we're bringing this amendment forward in recognition of the significance of the Section 9 powers and are content to make those subject to the affirmative procedure. Now, I note that the Committee also recommended making affirmative procedures to Section 4 and 7 uh, of the Bill. Uh, those sections enable the Scottish Ministers to extend electronic monitoring into other criminal court disposals, such as bail or other forms of early, early release. Uh, we do not think uh, it is necessary to have affirmative procedures here, uh, as the effect of those is only to widen the discretion of the courts and ministers in relation to electronic monitoring. The bill does not enable the creation of new criminal court disposals or forms of early, early release. Uh, rather, it sets out uh, those disposals and forms of early release that can be electronically, or electronically monitored at the courts or indeed Scottish ministers' uh, discretions. The powers in this bill just ensure that where a movement or consumption restriction can be imposed by a court uh, or the Scottish ministers, uh, if it is deemed appropriate to do so, the electronic monitoring regime can be extended to include that restriction. Uh, for those reasons, we don't think the changes are required to the SSI procedure around Section 4 and Section 7, but we are taking forward this amendment in relation to Section 9 around uses of information and I move Amendment 101 in my name. Do members have any comments? In which case, uh, Cabinet Secretary, we move straight to the question, I think. Um, the question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 61, name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? 7-2. Seven, 7-2. Two. Seven, two, um, amendment 61 is agreed to. Call Amendment 62 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. 7-2, Seven two. Seven two, um, which means Amendment 62 is agreed. The question is that Section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 103 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 103. Thank you, Convener. Uh, when an individual is convicted on indictment and sentenced to imprisonment for less than four years, the court may impose a supervised release order, known as an SRO, uh, on the individual where it considers it necessary to protect the public from serious harm from the individual on their release. The SRO imposed under Section 209 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 excuse me, provides a period of supervision on licence for short-term prisoners who would otherwise be released into the community unconditionally. The SRO commences and the prisoner's release cannot exceed 12 months and cannot extend past the sentence end date. However, a short-term prisoner can become a long-term prisoner if they receive a consecutive or partially concurrent sentence, um, and those separate sentences form a single term of four years or more. Although SROs are only imposed on prisoners sentenced to short-term sentences, a short-term prisoner with an SRO could become a long-term prisoner 
with an SRO at a later date by virtue of receiving additional prison sentences. Following changes to automatic early release in February 2016, a long-term prisoner who is subject to a 12-month SRO uh, imposed for a constituent part of their single-term sentence could be released on licence for only six months. In those circumstances, the 12 months SRO would extend for six months beyond the sentence end date. This would result in an inadvertent breach of the requirement in Section 209 of the 1995 Act that the SRO cannot extend beyond the sentence end date. As long-term prisoners are always released on licence, there doesn't appear to be any need for an SRO to remain in place when a short-term prisoner becomes a long-term prisoner by virtues of the rules in single terming. Uh, for the reason I have set out, I have brought forward Amendment 103, which will allow an SRO to fall where a prisoner becomes a long-term prisoner by operation of the rules on single terming of prison sentences. I ask the committee uh, supports the Government Amendment 103 and I move it in my name. Do members have any questions or comments? Daniel Johnson. And this is really just a brief sort of technical uh, query. I mean, I understand uh, in terms of what the, the Cabinet Secretary just said, but I just would like to clarify. I mean, obviously, it's important that the possibility of um, our release in terms of rehabilitation remains in place for long-term prisoners. So I just want to just clarify that this isn't removing that as a possibility. It's merely about uh, technicalities, about what form that takes for, for long-term prisoners. Is, 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 is that correct, really, is my question? Uh, yeah, yes, his understanding is correct. I mean, uh, although the changes were made to automatic uh, early release, of course, a long-term prisoner uh, would still have the, the of course, uh, uh, the, well, the programmes within the prison, of course, for rehabilitation, but also the chance to progress through the normal routes uh, to, to get release on, 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 on parole and so on and so forth. And this doesn't look to change any of that uh, whatsoever, but it is just technical for the reasons that I, I mentioned a moment ago. Any other questions, comments? In that case, the question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 104 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 93. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 63 in the name of Daniel Jens Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Not moved. Um, we therefore... Um, point of order, if I might, Kavina, because I don't understand the process. I would like to move that yep. amendment. Yeah, you just move it then. I move the amendment in Daniel Johnson's name. Amendment 63. Right. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We're not all agreed. Is that right? Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Two in favour, seven against. Amendment 63 is not agreed. Call Amendment 1 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, group with Amendment 102. <coughs> Lewis MacDonald to move Amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener, and I'm very grateful that the uh, committee has grouped the, these two amendments be together because they both essentially serve the same purpose. And uh, Amendment 1 seeks to make completion of a declaration of income form mandatory, and Amendment 102 seeks to subsume deduction of benefit orders into enforcement orders. Uh, both The purpose in both cases is to uh, make the system work the way it is intended uh, and to ensure uh, that when fines are imposed by the courts, they are actually uh, collected and the courts have the means uh, with which to do so. Community, you, you may recall that I made a submission uh, last year uh, in relation to the bill. That focused particularly on the content of Amendment 1, the Declaration of Income Forms, but it quickly became clear in pursuing the matter that the fact that benefit uh, deductions were separate from other enforcement mechanisms was also a fault and a weakness in the current system. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for discussing this matter with me uh, some weeks ago and, and for, for writing to me further on the matter last week. Essentially, the uh, inspiration, the, the, the prompt for these amendments came from uh, a very ordinary, everyday case in Aberdeen, Michelle Gavin, a very uh, hard-working woman, but a woman without 
uh, uh, money in the bank, sh shall we say, um, who was the victim of a very minor offence. An intruder uh, broke her garden fence while seeking to avoid a conversation with uh, police officers. The, the courts, the procurator fiscal, rather than uh, uh, prosecute him for an offence, uh, offered him a compensation order whereby he would pay Michelle Gavin the £400 it would take to fix her fence. Uh, since that, that, that happened three years ago. Um, from that compensation order, the uh, uh, individual in question has paid £7.50 uh, to Michelle Gavin. Uh, the court service confirmed that they weren't able to replace the penalty with a different penalty, for example, uh, that, that she should be compensated by, by the courts and the courts should then recover from the offender. That's not an option. Uh, there was no, they have no means to enforce this compensation order uh, because they don't know, there's no, they cannot require the individual to complete a declaration of income form. They therefore don't know uh, what income he has. Um, they, they have no means to uh, impose an alternative penalty. Uh, and that means three years later, Michelle Gavin uh, is still £392.50 out of pocket. Uh, the individual has been uh, had, has been subject to a warrant on five different occasions. He has been held overnight in remand on a number of different occasions. He has appeared in court on a number of different occasions. As I say, on one occasion he made a small payment. On all the other appearances in court in, in relation to this very minor matter, uh, he has been offered opportunities to pay over a period of time, has accepted them, but has then failed to do so. So this is, if you like, a, a, a situation where what is required is the ability of the courts to actually uh, require people who have been found guilty of an offence or who have accepted an offer of a compensation order uh, as an alternative to prosecution to require them to actually uh, pay up uh, and, and, and at the very minimum uh, to uh, provide the information the courts need in order to pursue the matter. So um, the, the purpose of, of both amendments, although they are different in form, essentially is the same. Uh, I don't think there is any dispute that there is a weakness in the system that needs to be addressed. I think that appears to be universally accepted. There was a report done by the, uh, published by the Scottish Government in 2011, which uh, summed up cases like uh, Michelle Gavin's uh, very well. There is still some churn within the system, uh, the report said. Uh, cases in which non-payment is accompanied by limited information about defaulters who are then cited to court, fail to appear, have a warrant issued, given more time to pay, do not pay, are cited back to court, fail to appear, and so on. Improving access to information and therefore the ability of fines enforcement officers to pursue defaulters effectively could reduce the churn, limit the input of police and courts, improve the speed of fine payment enforcement and potentially reduce the costs uh, associated with enforcement while increasing fine payment and thus the credibility of the fine. So it's a win-win uh, uh, proposal to amend the law. There, there is no uh, a difference in the penalty imposed on, on a person found guilty of an offence or who accepts a compensation order. There is simply more prospect that that money will eventually be paid. Uh, that clearly for somebody like Michelle Gavin would make an enormous difference um, and for many other victims of crime uh, it would be uh, very positive. And for those who become entangled in the courts uh, um, because they have committed an offence, uh, there will be much greater clarity about the cons what the consequences are uh, of a, a, a fine uh, being imposed. Uh, the, the numbers I have for 2017-18 are that in, in that year there were 48,000 court citations uh, for the non-payment of fines for compensation and 21,000 arrest warrants were issued. This is clearly a vast amount of public resource which is being used to no particular purpose, uh, which would be far better used uh, in actually securing uh, payment uh, uh, according to the letter of the law. And that's what these amendments are intended to achieve. And I move Amendment 1. Okay. Comments from members? Liam Kerr and Liam McCarthy. Just by way of reassurance, really, I'm grateful to Lewis MacDonald for his explanation, which I think is sensible, and I certainly would like to vote for these amendments. Just for clarity and for reassurance, uh, the uh, Amendment 1 is not about means testing of fines, is it, Mr MacDonald? I'm, I'm happy to, to reply directly. It is not about means testing of fines. It does not uh, alter, alter the position of... Uh, and a person convicted or, or accepting a compensation order in any way other than, as it says in the amendment, that they should 
complete the Declaration of Income Form. At the moment, they are asked to complete a Declaration of Income Form in these circumstances, but not required to do so. Uh, and in very many cases, they don't, and therefore the courts are unable to per, uh, proceed further. Okay. Thank Liam you. MacArthur, then Daniel Johnson. Thanks very much. And, and can I too thank Lewis MacDonald, not just for the explanation this morning, but for the, the written note he helpfully provided uh, as well. And I recognise the fact that um, this builds on a, a submission made um, in an earlier part of the uh, process of consideration of this bill. Notwithstanding that, I think um, I've got some anxieties about the, the lack of evidence we, we took through, uh, through stage one on an issue which, from the, the figures quoted by Lewis MacDonald this morning, does seem to be part of uh, a wider uh, a wider picture, which uh, I think should give all of us cause for uh, some concern. I, I suppose my anxiety is, is a, a little more along the lines of uh, creating a, a requirement from which there doesn't seem to be an exemption for sort of a reasonable excuse, uh, creating a, a, a requirement um, to submit a declaration of of, of, of income, uh, failure to do so would then in itself be uh, criminalised, there would be a, a, a penalty, a fine uh, for that and, and I think there's a potential there, certainly in some circumstances, to, to kind of exacerbate the situation, um, accelerate a, a kind of downward spiral in terms of um, uh, financial difficulties. So I, I think I think Lewis MacDonald set out very, very clearly, illustrating it with a case which I, I don't underestimate the frustrations for the for the individual in, involved. Um, it's obviously part of a wider issue. I think I'd feel more comfortable um, a, a addressing this in in the round, taking evidence from uh, a, a number of the the, the, the stakeholders. But I, I think it's certainly been helpful to to air it through the context of this bill, and I'll, I'll listen carefully to what the cabinet secretary has to say in, in response. Okay. Um Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Camino. I'd just like to speak briefly in support. I mean, I think uh, what we need to recognise is that when people pursue claims such as these through the courts, it's nor normally at the end of a very prolonged period of um, stress and difficulty that they've been experiencing. And if they then fail to actually get the result they want purely because of a form not being filled in correctly, I think we can understand why that would cause not just frustration, but actually I think a, a, a great deal of, of mistrust and disappointment in the system itself. And therefore I think this is a sensible proposal, which means that a simple bit of uh, bureaucracy doesn't stop um, the courts actually seeing through the process which they've been asked to undertake. And more importantly, and important to address Liam MacArthur's point, I mean, while I, I think I well understand the points he's making, this is the point at which those considerations should be made about what the impacts will be in terms of the fine on the individuals, the judgment itself. This is simply about making sure that judgments and awards of compensation can actually be uh, seen through once they've been made. Now, I, mean, I fully accept the points that he's making about those impacts, but the point for that decision-making is the judgment itself. So, for those reasons, I would urge members to support these members, because I think they are about making sure that these processes are robust and do what they're intended to do. Dr. Lenrona. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Lewis MacDonald for putting forward the case and, 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 and representing his constituent in such an articulate manner. But I do have concerns, like uh, Liam MacArthur, about this particular amendment. And probably before I'd be in a position to, to vote for a, an amendment like this, I would need more information about how um, it could possibly impact on the process that we've got in place, because we've got quite a robust process in place, um, diverting people from prosecution, which I think there's general cross-party support for uh, in the chamber. And although this specific example, I don't think anybody would, would disagree with the specific example, as set out by Lewis MacDonald, that there is a, a, an injustice there and in a, 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 a churn in the system. Th th this would need to be looked at in the overall context. Uh, and I would, I would have real worries about that. So at this point in time, convener, I'm inclined to reject it. Although obviously I'll hear what the Cabinet Secretary's got to say on the matter. Rona. Thank you, convener. Yes, um, similar to, to Fulton, I, I, I have some reservations, and one being, well, we didn't take evidence in this, so I don't feel I actually know too much about it. But the other one is I just feel it's... I can't see the logic in fining for a non-payment of fine, uh, piling another fine onto another fine. I just, I, I agree it's a problem and, and it was well well um, articulated, but I just can't see the logic in doing that. Uh, John Finney. Um, thank you, Kavina. Um, 
But um, I, I come to McDonald outlining this story before, and I have to say I find it deeply frustrating because, as someone's already alluded to, we would hope that diversion from prosecution would be seen in a positive light rather than... And these, these are clearly uh, unacceptable figures. Um, I, I remain to be persuaded this is the answer. I don't know if it's just piling another list to a charge sheet that's going to be ignored anyway. But clearly we can't have a situation where there are people many around this table who are encouraging alternatives to custodial sentences and there's discredit being attached to that. So like others, I'm very keen to hear what the Cabinet Secretary says and I don't anticipate hearing that he thinks that it is an accept the status quo is acceptable. So if this isn't the answer, maybe it's Cabinet Secretary and I would like what possibly could be the answer. Um, just as it seems to me an eminently sensible um, uh, amendment that um, having accepted a compensation order, the person should then, you know, refuse to fill in a declaration form um, doesn't seem to me um, just in any way, not least because of the churn it causes in the court, the relevant costs and the fact that the victim is left in the case you mentioned, um, Lewis MacDonald, three years later without the, the payment being made. So for all these reasons, I'd be minded absolutely to support this Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. I can also thank Lewis MacDonald uh, for articulating uh, well uh, the reasons why he's brought this forward uh, and also his consistency. I know he's had an interest in this, uh, both in the side of the table that he's at, but also on the other side of the table that he occupied uh, when, when his party uh, went in government a number of years ago, uh, because we all, uh, as has been articulated, at this uh, committee session already uh, got a joint interest in making sure that the fine system um, is working even better uh, than it currently is. And let me try to address some of the points. So um, a number of committee members have expressed some reservations around the amendments that Lewis MacDonald uh, has brought forward. I share those reservations much for the same reasons around the evidence base or, or, or lack thereof of this particular course of action uh, working. Um, and, and also... Um, a challenge from committee members such as John Finney, who just spoke a moment ago, to government, which is if this is not the answer, then what could potentially work? So I'll try to address both those points, um, if I can. Before I do that, perhaps just setting the context is, is, is hugely uh, important. Um, fine collection rates in Scotland are actually uh, very high. Uh, at the end of February, uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service released figures stating that 89%, 89% of the value of Sheriff Court and JP Court fines alike uh, imposed during the three-year period 2015 to 2018 uh, had either been paid uh, or, or was on track uh, to be paid. Um, of course, the remainder will be a hard nut to crack, and I appreciate that's exactly what Lewis MacDonald uh, is, uh, and his amendments are, are aimed to, to try to fix. However, I'm not convinced that Amendment 1 is the best way to go about doing this. Uh, I'm concerned, as others have already articulated, about the circularity of creating a new offence, attaching a penalty or, or, or a fine, precisely where the individual concerned have demonstrated their failure to engage with fine enforcement officers already. Um, Lee MacArthur uh, rightly asked the question about what evidence is there that this approach would necessarily work. Um, the likelihood that the offence uh, would be little used um, comes from the fact that in England and Wales um, it, it is uh, not uh, used to the extent that people might well think. Uh, experience in England and Wales does not in fact suggest the declaration of income form uh, is very helpful uh, at all. Uh, in any event, there's also technical issues with the drafting of this amendment. The two most <coughs> important are that there's no deadline to fill in the form uh, and there's also no provision about a quote-unquote reasonable excuse. Uh, the lack of deadline means it's impossible to know when the offence is actually committed. Uh, the lack of provisions on reasonable excuse would make this a strict liability uh, offence. I'd be extremely reluctant to do this. Uh, people can fail to receive notice through no fault of their own or may have perfectly good reason for non-compliance, uh, such as serious illness, injury, etc. etc. <clears throat> there are other more technical difficulties with the amendment, um, which I can discuss if the committee wishes to. However, what I particularly want to say is that the government will be working on arrangements which will make it unnecessary to seek information by declaration of income forms. And this is to the point that John Finney uh, asked uh, directly. Uh, instead, it will be possible for the court service to obtain relevant information directly from the Department of Work and Pensions and HM Revenue and Customs. Uh, the court service has been seeking these powers for some time, but reserve legislation was necessary. However, this gap has now been addressed by the coming into effect of the Digital Economy Act 
2017. Powers in that Act enable information to be shared between public bodies, bodies for the purposes of taking action on debt uh, to and, and fraud against a public authority. We plan regulations that, if approved, will enable Scottish bodies to move towards using the debt and fraud powers respectively. We plan to progress drafting consultation on and scrutiny of these regulations in the next few months with a view to laying finalised draft regulations before the Scottish Parliament, where they'll be subject to the affirmative procedure in the course of 2019. If these regulations are approved, the court service would then be able to make, uh, take the necessary steps towards developing a data sharing arrangement with DWP and HMRC. Obtaining information directly from DWP and HMRC would be a more effective way of dealing with the position, particularly for individuals who have already proved themselves reluctant to engage with the court service without creating another circular criminal offence. Uh, given this is a better way of improving the fines enforcement system uh, and the difficulties I've explained with Mr Macdonald's amendment, I hope that he will not press it. If he does so, I would ask the committee to reject it. As to Amendment 102, I have concerns both about the content of the amendment and, and the legislative competence. Um, as regards difficulties with drafting, there are existing regulations made under Section 24, Subsection 1A of the Criminal Justice Act 1991, the fines deduction from income support regulations 1992. These already provide that the court may, after making an inquiry as to an offender's means, apply to the Secretary of State asking for deductions of sums for the relevant benefit at any time where a fine has been opposed. Uh, given that the court already has this power, I'm not clear what the purpose in restating this in the amendment uh, may well be. Um, subsection 2 of the proposed amendment equally does not seem to add anything to the existing powers of 226E of the Criminal Procedures uh, Scotland Act 1995. This already gives fine enforcement officers the power to request the relevant court to make an application. Uh, deduction from benefits for the purpose of meeting an individual's debts are explicitly reserved and the 1992 regulation, which already exists in this matter, are made and subsequently amended by the UK Government. The application is to the UK Secretary of State. If this amendment could be interpreted as a restriction on a court's ability to apply for a dedu deduction from benefits order under the 1992 regulations, it could relate to reserved matters. This could present a vides challenge to the legislation as a whole, and so we can't support it. So for reasons of competence, um, but also of content, I hope Mr Macdonald will not press Amendment 1 or 2, but if he does, I must ask members not to support it, should it be pushed to a vote. Before I bring uh, Lewis Macdonald in, can I clarify something with the Cabinet Secretary? You mentioned the Digital Economy Act um, would allow for the relevant information from public bodies to be provided. If a person had private income, um, would that be covered? Um, I would, don't think it would necessarily be covered by information that is with uh, DWP uh, and HMRC. That's but yeah, uh, from the point of tax, um, you know, the tax that they pay, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, could be uh, received from HMRC. Um, so uh, it could cover that side of the income. But it seems to me that it would be clearer if the person just um, declared all the earnings um, in a declaration of income form. Well, I think, uh, as I've said in, in, in my statement already, that um, I understand the, the nut that is trying to be cracked. I'm not convinced that this is the best way of doing it because of the circularity argument, which we made by a number of members, but it's one that I agree with. I think piling another offence um, and another fine potentially onto somebody who's already shown reluctance to pay one um, is just not the way to, to quite address a problem which Lewis MacDonald has, has, and others have well articulated. Lewis MacDonald, to wind up, press or withdraw. Thank you very much, Convener. I listened very carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary had to say, and, and it reflects uh, what he said in, in his letter to me uh, last week, which, which I'm happy to acknowledge. I think, the, I think the point here in relation to Amendment 1 is that it creates one mechanism to require uh, a person before the courts to, to provide the information that the courts require. I very much welcome the steps the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, which is to find another mechanism for doing the same thing from the other end and uh, relating to the convener's question. I think it, 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 the convener's question was, was a sound one because, uh, on the one hand, uh, the measures which the Cabinet Secretary intends to pursue, and I think he said uh, to have in place in the course of this calendar year. That, those, those measures would clearly be helpful in, in requiring public bodies or enabling public bodies to seek information from other public bodies about public uh, benefits and other income uh, and tax, as, as, as he has said, and that's welcome. Uh, but if, if you like, the, 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 the simile here is, is belt and braces. It is 
the measures which the Cabinet Secretary intends to take forward in relation to the public bodies and the measures which Parliament has the opportunity here to take forward in relation to the individual. And I think uh, that seems to me a sensible way to proceed. And while I very much welcome what the Cabinet Secretary said, I don't think it precludes the advantages that come from taking a different approach at the same time. Uh, Rona Mackay and, and the Cabinet Secretary and others raised the question of, is this potentially going to create a circular defence, fining people for, for non-payment of fines? I think the practical reality in a court of law in dealing with minor offences is that where a declaration of income form is put before somebody, and their lawyer says to them, you don't have to fill that in, they don't fill it in. If their lawyer said to them, you do have to fill that in, they would fill it in. And I think that's the reality on the ground. I take the point that the Cabinet Secretary has made that uh, in, 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 in the final version of, of, of the law, it ought to provide for a deadline, it ought to provide for reasonable excuse in order to avoid perverse and unintended consequences. If the committee agrees to these amendments today, then clearly the Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure, will bring forward amendments in relation to those specific points in order to ensure the law is working in the way it is intended to do. Uh, so I hope, I hope that that is uh, his approach. I, I understand the questions that members have raised around whether we have enough evidence of the impact on the system. I think, I think it's sufficient um, from, from my point of view uh, to, 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 to go back to the views uh, of uh, the court, uh, the court, the sheriff clerks, and, and of the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, um, in relation to the case I mentioned earlier, there are no further sanctions available to the fines enforcement team uh, for the penalty at this time. Uh, in order to make arrestment of income or benefits, the offender must first provide the court with information regarding his income which he has failed to provide, the offender is not legally obliged to provide this information to the court. So those are the views of the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service. They would love this individual case to be resolved and many thousands of cases like it. They, they are powerless to do so under the current provision. And so why I'm offering the government and asking the government to accept is an additional uh, power for the court's service to carry out the duties which is seeking to deliver. And I know, um, certainly from the point of view of those involved with this particular case, but I suspect for others within the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, uh, having that power would be very welcome. The Cabinet Secretary raised concerns about whether Amendment 102 um, was uh, at risk of uh, breaching vires, uh, at rich, risk of entering into reserved areas or potentially limiting the, the ability of the court to apply the existing law. Again, the practical reality is that, yes, the courts can seek uh, deductions from benefits by applying to a court uh, in, 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 in the way that, that the Cabinet Secretary has described. The problem is that currently that has to be separate from other fines enforcement action. So, in other words, it doubles the burden uh, financial and uh, administrative burden on those seeking to enforce fines uh, and therefore uh, uh, does, not, uh, is not, does not work effectively and efficiently at the moment. So this amendment, while less central than Amendment 1, would certainly improve the efficiency of the system uh, and I, I therefore would wish uh, the committee to take a view on both of these amendments. Clearly, again, should the committee pass Amendment 1 or 2, if the Cabinet Secretary's Concerns around the technical aspects of 102 are well founded. I'm sure he will come back at stage three with the appropriate amendments in order to ensure that the amendment works in the way it's meant to do. It is simply meant to make it easier for the courts to do their jobs uh, and for fine enforcement to be carried forward. So I would uh, intend to press these amendments. Thank you. The question is Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. We are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Six, three, against. Uh, three in favour, six against. Amendment one is not agreed to. Call Amendment 102 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, already debated with Amendment one. Lewis MacDonald to move or not move? Moved. Moved. Um, the question is that Amendment 102 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not all agreed. Uh, therefore, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three in favour, six against. Amendment 102 is not agreed. The question is that sections 17 to 32 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We are all agreed. Call the amendment 105 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendment 106, 107, 108, 109 and 110. Cabinet Secretary to move 100, amendment 105 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Kavina. I move uh, the amendments uh, in my name. Uh, amendments 105 to 108 in this grouping <coughs> make new provision in part two of the bill relating to disclosure of convictions. Stakeholders in the committee have generally welcomed the provisions in part two as a sensible and progressive reform to the system of basic disclosure. However, there was one specific area where some stakeholders, stakeholders suggested reforms could go further. Uh, as members will be aware, changes proposed in the bill will result in custodial sentence, sentences of up to and including 48 months having a disclosure period attached to them. This means a person receiving such a sentence can, at some future date, know their conviction will become spent. The bill increases this threshold from 30 months in this regard. While welcoming this reform, some stakeholders raise concern that this still meant that people who receive sentences of greater than 48 months will be left facing a lifetime of disclosure. It is clearly the case that to receive a sentence of more than 48 months, a serious offence must have been committed. However, a system that does not even permit the possibility of not needing to disclose under basic disclosure would seem disproportionate. And I emphasise that term, basic disclosure. We are not looking to change anything in this bill within high-level disclosure. So what Amendments 105 to 108 do is provide for an enabling power for the Scottish Ministers to bring forward regulations that would, in effect, create an independent review mechanism for certain sentences greater than 48 months. Not everyone in receipt of a sentence greater than 48 months would be able to apply for a review. Amendment 105 provides that if a person was serving a life sentence, then they would not be able to seek a review, as that is not one of the currently excluded sentences mentioned in subsection 3 as being, relevant, uh, as being a relevant sentence for the purposes of review. Also, Amendment 105 provides that if a person was subject to sex offender notification requirements, they too would not be able to seek a review. It is important to stress nothing in these amendments uh, directly affects the operation of higher level disclosure. As members will be aware, that system is based on the offence committed rather than the sentence received. And there are no charges being no changes being made, uh, as I say, to higher level disclosure in these amendments. In more detail, Amendment 105 provides for certain uh, matters relating to the review process. This includes setting the time periods when a person can seek review. For someone who was convicted and received a sentence of greater than 48 months when aged 18 or older, they will be able to apply six years after the end of their sentence for a review. So someone receiving, say, a seven-year sentence uh, will be able to apply 13 years after being convicted, uh, the seven-year sentence in the six-year uh, buffer period. For someone who was convicted and received a sentence of greater than 48 months when aged under 18, they can apply three years after the end of their sentence. So someone receiving a five-year sentence will be able to apply uh, eight years after being convicted, the five-year sentence, and then the three-year buffer uh, period. Amendment 106 indicates uh, certain general details of the independent review process that may be provided for uh, in the regulations. These include the process of making an application, any fees payable, and how applications will be determined, amongst a number of other matters. Amendment 106 also provides that any consequential changes that may be needed to the operation of higher-level disclosure can be made through regulations. Amendment 107 provides an enabling power to allow the Scottish Ministers to adjust either the age when different buffer periods apply or indeed the length of uh, those buffer periods or indeed both. Uh, these are found in Amendment 105. This flexibility ensures that future changes can be made through secondary legislation uh, if, for example, different buffer periods are considered appropriate at some, at some future date. Amendment 108 provides that regulations under Amendment 105 and Amendment 107 are subject to affirmative procedures. Um, convener organisations such as the Howard League and the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research called for steps to be taken to help those receiving longer sentences to be able to, at some future date, have their convictions considered spent. The taking of these enabling powers will allow the Scottish Government to bring forward a future scheme for full scrutiny by the Scottish Parliament through affirmative procedure to allow exactly for that. I would ask members to support amendments 105 to 108. Amendments 109 and 110 are technical amendments that make minor changes in the bill as introduced with no policy impact. So I move amendments, amendment 105 in my name. Do members have any comments? 
I, I merely comment that I note the, the Cabinet Secretary um, makes it quite clear so these are basic disclosures um, and I think we can take some comfort that the regulations will be um, uh, under the affirmative instrument procedure so there will be transparency when, um, when we come to debate them. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to say anything further? I'll make the amendment in my name. The question is that Amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, call Amendment 106 to 108, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 106 to 108 on block. Moved on block. Right. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 106 to 108? No. no. Okay. The question is that amendments 106 to 108 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. We now move on to... Yeah. The question is that section 33 and 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call the cabinet, uh, call amendment 109 in the name of the cabinet secretary already debated with amendment 105. Cabinet secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we agreed? We are all agreed. Call amendment 110 in the name of the cabinet secretary already debated with amendment 105. Cabinet secretary to move formally. Moved. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 110 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Sections 35 and 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Amendment 111 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendments 112, 113, 124, 125, 126 and 112. 27 Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 111 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendment uh, 111 is provided for consistency and limits the extent of the amendment in Section 37 of the Bill so as the reference to instrument of appointment in the appointment process to membership of the Pro Board is no longer deleted. This is uh, useful anticipation of Amendment 111. Uh, two and 112. Amendment 112 allows for the instrument of appointment to be uh, annotated and reissued so as to show that the member is reappointed if and when this occurs by virtue of section 38 of the bill. This is for completeness in the administration of the process of reappointment to the Pro Board. Amendment 113 is minor uh, drafting amendment. The sense of the word the wording is better stated as inclusive, uh, although no change uh, in, in effect results. Amendment uh, 124 and 125 are reordering amendments. Sections 44 and sections 45 are moved to the top of part three in order to accommodate new provisions while leaving the part to unfold uh, in logical order. Amendments 126, Amendment 126 will change the oversight body concerning the appointment of Pro Board members. Section 38 of the bill amends the current appointment procedure for the Pro Board of Scotland. This will provide that a parole board member can continue in office on a five-year rolling basis. Reappointment like this is uh, until they reach the age of retirement, provided they meet the terms of reappointment and they're not some, for some reason removed from office. An appointment to the parole board is a public appointment in Scotland. Uh, this is currently governed by the Public Appointments and Public Bodies, etc. Scotland Act 2003. The parole board falls under the remit of the Commissioner of Ethical Standards and Public Life, who monitors how people are appointed to the boards of specific public bodies. At present, parole board appointments are governed by the Code of Practice set by the Commissioner, which provides that a member's term of office must be no more than eight years in total. Section 38 of the Bill will provide that appointments to the parole board can continue beyond eight years, which will ultimately put the parole board out with the parameters of the Commissioner's Code. Therefore, this amendment removes the parole board for Scotland from the public appointments and public bodies, etc. Scotland Act 2003, and from the remit of the Commissioner's Court of Practice. However, to ensure independent oversight is continued and to bring the Pro Board appointments in line with other tribunals, this amendment uh, also amends Section 10 of the Judiciary and Courts uh, Scotland Act 2008 to add the Pro Board to the remit of the Judicial Appointments Board for Scotland. This will result in the Judicial Appointments Board becoming the oversight body for the appointment of members of the Pro Board of Scotland. To give committee some reassurances, the Pro Board are content with this change. Amendment 127 will change the long title of the bill in light of the various changes I'm proposing to Part 3. Uh, this is a technical matter for the sake of continuing accuracy. I move Amendment 111 uh, in my name. 
Do members have any comments? Okay. The question is, that Amendment 11 be agreed to, are we all agreed? 111 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yep. Uh, the question is that Section 37 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 112 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 111. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. And the question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. Uh, call Amendment 113 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 111. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Call Amendment 114 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 114. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Convener. This amendment to Section 26C of the Prisoners and Criminal Proceedings Act of 1993 is required to address a minor issue in the legislative provisions for releasing prisoners in order to benefit their reintegration into the community. Section 2 of the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Act 2015 inserted Section 26C into the 1993 Act to allow the Scottish Ministers to release a person up to two days early if that would be beneficial for their reintegration into the community. The legislation previously passed by Parliament provides that a release date can be brought forward by two days. That wording creates a potential difficulty where a prisoner falls to be released on a Monday and public holidays such as Christmas Day or Boxing Day fall immediately thereafter, as was the case on Christmas Eve 2018. Christmas Eve is not a public holiday, uh, but there is limited service provision on that day and no service provision for two days thereafter. In those circumstances, releasing a prisoner two days early would not assist the prisoner as they would be released at the weekend when vital services are also closed. The Scottish Prison Service can, of course, liaise with local authorities and other service providers to ensure that services are in place rather than utilising the early release provision. Indeed, this was the approach that was taken by SPS on Christmas Eve in Hogmanay 2018. The combination of weekends and public holidays that would cause this issue is not expected to occur again until 2029. But if we are good at nothing else, convener forward planning uh, is something that we are good at in the Scottish Government. So, however, we are taking this legislative opportunity to amend Section 26C to provide that a release date can be brought forward by two working days. This would enable prisoners who would otherwise be released on a Monday where limited services are in place to be released uh, on the preceding Friday. Um, the change will bring the effect of the legislation in line with the original policy intent and provide the flexibility to the time release um, to benefit reintegration uh, and, of course, access to vital services. I move the amendment, my name. John Finney. I, mean, I, I support this provision, and, and it's the, the phrase that the Cabinet Secretary used just at the end there, the original policy intent. I, I suspect this was an unintended consequence of, of the well-meaning move earlier, but if all the issues that concern the committee about effective release and having in place all the mechanisms, then this pragmatic approach, albeit it's going to be some time before it'll need to be applied again, um, uh, is the way ahead. So I'm very supportive of it. Liam MacArthur. Like John Finney, I certainly very much welcome the, the addressing of what is clearly, I think, uh, an anomaly. Uh, I think we'll come later on to amendments uh, addressing some of the, the concerns the committee's had uh, about uh, the, the ways that are taken to, to maximise the success of, of reintegration back into the into the community. Um, uh, how those amendments will, will fall uh, remains to be seen, but I think uh, addressing the, the, the current anomaly uh, through this amendment is very welcome and I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for bringing it forward. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Nothing to add, uh, just to move the amendment to many. Okay. The question is that Amendment 115 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Oh, sorry, 114. <coughs> sorry. I think I'll move on. Sorry. The question is that Amendment 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Amendment, uh, call Amendment 115 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with amendments 118, 119 and 120. Cabinet Secretary to move 100, Amendment 115 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendments uh, 115, 118, 119 and 120 form part of a package of measures in response to the two home detention curfew reports uh, from HMICS and HMIPS. 
The other measures include creation of the offence of remaining unlawfully at large, legislating to improve powers of recall, and the non-legislative improvements to revise guidance and uh, interagency communication. This grouping refers to changes specific to home detention curfew eligibility and operation. HDC is a form of early release from prison, uh, as we know, and can currently be granted to long-term or short-term prisoners. Subject to certain requirements as to the time served by the prisoner, HDC can be granted in the six months leading up to the halfway stage of the prisoner's sentence. For long-term prisoners, there's an added requirement that they release on parole at the parole qualifying date. The halfway stage uh, of the sentence must be pre-approved by the parole board. Uh, Amendment 115 repeals HDC for long-term prisoners, those sentenced to imprisonment uh, for four years or more, leaving HDC available only to short-term uh, prisoners. We consider that the repeal of HDC for long-term prisoners ensures that the community monitoring regime for long... Uh, yes, I will. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary to take an intervention. In, re in relation to Amendment 103 and a question from my colleague Daniel Johnson about supervised release orders, um, you answered that there would be no diminution of uh, a range of facilities available for prisoners. Surely this Amendment 115, which we're told in a, a note, a purpose and effect note, which I presume the source is the Scottish Government, um, very clearly as will prevent long-term prisoners from accessing home detention curfew. Surely removing an option when we're looking at the management isn't a positive move. Uh, I'll address some of those concerns uh, in my speaking note uh, in, in, in a second, but it's probably worth also putting some context around some of the numbers of long-term prisoners in HDCP, HDC. It corresponds to around 0.5%, so half a percent of all of those on, on HCC, but also we know, and again I'll come to this point in greater detail, that long-term prisoners don't often take up uh, HDC for, for a whole host of reasons, um, but for some of the risk that might be involved in them being recalled back to prison. Uh, what I would say uh, is that, of course, we're enacting and taking forward uh, what I think are, are important measures on the basis of two independent uh, inspectorate uh, reports. I think we have to give them uh, weight. Uh, the member knows fine well um, some of my views on, on, on the fact that the pendulum may well have swung too directly in, in the other way when it comes to HCC for short-term prisoners, but I think this move is, is a sensible one. But Take an intervention. That, that very point, the risk aversion that we're concerned that we've seen a significant drop, there you're legislating for a further drop. Albeit these are small numbers, these are individuals for whom a range of options should be available, including home detention curfew. Well, uh, I think there's a number of advantages, if I can say, for, for repealing HDC uh, for long-term prisoners. But I don't think, although the pendulum, I agree with them, and a number of members have made this point, that there's a question about whether the pendulum has swung uh, too, too far in the other direction, um, when long-term prisoners only account for half a percent. I'm, I'm not convinced that it's going to add uh, greatly to that. But I, I, I don't take away from the principle of the point that John Finney makes. Um, I think there are a number of advantages of, of repealing HDC uh, for long-term prisoners. Um, HMICS, if I go back to the independent inspectorate, uh, call for a presumption against HCC for those convicted of certain serious offences. Um, this amendment achieves that aim uh, in a more general sense. Uh, the length of a prison sentence generally reflects the seriousness of the offence. So removing HDC from long-term prisoners removes uh, HDC from those convicted uh, of more serious offences. Uh, it's also worth... Yes. Very grateful. I, I'm echoing the, the, the concerns that John Finney has raised. I think during the evidence session we were told uh, by both yourself and by the SPS that the, the new procedures in place for um, consenting uh, or agreeing to HDCs uh, was far more robust. Uh, the, uh, the assessment that would be made of, of any risk was therefore, uh, I, I think, um, likely to have a greater degree of public confidence. And therefore, I think there has to be some concern that in, in, in generalising uh, the, uh, the the, the um, uh, the exclusion of uh, of the use of HDCs. Uh, I think there's some concern that the, the, the discretion um, that can be used by those who are uh, very senior, who are extremely experienced, is being uh, cut across. And I, and I accept the fact that uh, what we're not talking about here is large numbers. But given, um, I think, what is accepted as the, the benefit of HDCs in managing that reintegration, reintegration into the, the community, what we're what we're doing essentially through this uh, amendment, as John Finney has said, is removing the options of assessing that risk and, and identifying the best way of managing that process of reintegration for individuals. And we're not. 
Okay, can I say, <coughs> while uh, Lee MacArthur articulates his point, points well, uh, and again, uh, I, I fully accept the principle behind them, I suppose there's a couple of points to make. First, worth noting the SPS uh, agreed with the recommendations of the inspector reports, all of the recommendations, uh, as well as Police Scotland and, and, and the Scottish Government, so they will be fully aware of the comments from, from the individual inspectorate um, and, and the course of action that's being taken. The second thing uh, is that it's worth noting that for long-term prisoners there is a, a really substantial and robust process and programmes for rehabilitation within the prison service. So a long-term prisoner will have gone through, again, depending on the offence, particular rehabilitation uh, programmes. Um, and, 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 and there is, a, I think, an understandable reason why the vast majority of long-term prisoners, overwhelming uh, majority of long-term prisoners, do not opt for HTC as things stand. Uh, they receive those... Uh, just let me finish the point, if I may, and then, of course, I'll bring Daniel Johnson in. So I think for those, they, they, they don't go for it because uh, there's a potential... Um, they, they feel anyway that um, that if they were to, 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 to go for it, there's a risk of being recalled because of a breach and so on and so forth. So I think there are good reasons um, why, why, why we're bringing this forward. But I'll bring in Daniel Johnson. <clears throat> I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for taking the intervention. I just wonder if there's a... a a slight contradiction in the logic he's employing, and indeed, I think that I wonder if he's conflating seriousness of offence with, with with length of sentence. And in, for, for the very reasons he set out about rehabilitation being in place for long-term prisoners, I think there is some reason to think that somebody who's been in prison for a longer period of time might actually be safer to be released at the end of that time, as compared to somebody who's been in for a relatively shorter period of time. And and, and I think. There, for, for the, the, the crimes that, that were mine might have uh, from the reports were things which might have received a sentence of three or four years, whereas prisoners who've received substantially longer sentences, I think, may, might well be in a very different category altogether and indeed be looking at uh, being released from prison almost a lifetime uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 away from the original offence and maybe a very different person. I'm just wondering whether or not for those reasons, there, there may be some reasons to, to question the logic that the Cabinet Secretary is employing, and in particular that, that conflation between seriousness of offence and, and length of sentence received. And fairness, just as a point of note, I said generally it is accepted that the, the sentence length will, will often um, correspond and align itself with the seriousness of offence. I accept there are some, some, some anomalies to that, and, but generally speaking, I think it can be, can be accepted. Uh, as thus. I mean, the other advantage of, of having HTC just for short-term prisoners is that you have a process that is, uh, that is that can then be focused and tailored absolutely exclusively to that uh, array of uh, range of, of, of prisoners as opposed to having to maintain a set of arrangements to cater for those uh, who are not likely to apply in large numbers. It's worth noticing, worth noting at the moment that... Um, there are currently no long-term prisoners uh, on HDC. It just goes again to make the point that I'm, uh, or further demonstrate the point that I'm trying to make, that there are very few long-term prisoners uh, that take uh, take uh, advantage of, of HDC. Um, the repeal of HDC for long-term prisoners um, would be introduced for those sentenced after a specific date, obviously, to avoid taking a benefit away from prisoners who are currently entitled uh, to it. Um, work with stakeholders to explore and examine the operation of HTC for short-term prisoners uh, and the new presumptions against HTC is ongoing. Um, that work we know uh, is taken forward, uh, sorry, is led by advice from the Risk Management Authority and the factors more relevant to risk of serious harm. Uh, converting the current presumptions against HTC into statutory exclusions may still be uh, an option that's considered and if it is required uh, could be achieved by Scottish ministers via subordinate legislation. Um, worth talking to some of the other amendments uh, as well. Amendment 118, um, a present HDC can only be revoked uh, and the prisoner recalled to prison on the grounds that there has been a licence breach or a problem with remote monitoring. Uh, this is in contrast with the provisions of the 1993 Act to recall from parole and the provisions in the, young, uh, in the prisons and young offenders institutions uh, rules 2011 for recall from temporary release. Uh, Scottish ministers must recall a prisoner from parole on parole board recommendations, but may recall a prisoner from parole where recall is expedient in the public interest. Um, that's section 17 of the 1993 Act. 
The Governor may recall a prisoner from temporary release, whether or not the temporary release conditions have been breached, that is Rule 137 of the prison rules. Scottish ministers, therefore, have a wider discretion to recall prisoners from temporary release and parole than they do for recalling a prisoner from HTC. If an offender in the HTC is behaving in a way which causes concern, but without breaching the HTC licence conditions, it would be very difficult for ministers to order the recall of that prisoner from HTC. Uh, Amendment 118 uh, repeals completely the current limited grounds for recall from HTC Excuse me, and introduces a new power for ministers to recall from HTC where they consider revocation of the HTC licence and recall to prison are expedient in the public interest. This will bring the recall process of HTC into line with the wide discretion that ministers currently have to revoke a parole or temporary licence uh, and recall a prisoner to prison. We believe that the widening of the grounds for recall for HTC uh, represents a tightening up of the management of risk around the monitoring of those on HTC. Uh, Amendment uh, 118 will ensure that ministers will be able to recall a prisoner from HTC, as I say, without prisoner's behaviour in the community gives us cause for concern, but stops short of a breach of licence conditions. Uh, Amendment um, 119, uh, Scottish ministers can recall uh, a prisoner to prison from HTC where the prisoner has breached the licence conditions or there is a problem with remote monitoring. Uh, the Pro Board currently have a role in reviewing that decision for both long-term and short-term prisoners, uh, where the prisoner has made representation to Scottish ministers. The Pro Board can direct or decline or uh, decline to direct the Scottish ministers to cancel the revocation of HDC. Uh, section 17A, subsection 5 of the 1993 Act, currently provides that where the revocation of HDC is cancelled on Pro Board direction, the prisoner is to be treated for the purposes of Section 3A of the 1993 Act as if they had not been recalled. Section 3A of the 1993 Act is the power for Scottish ministers to release prisoners on HDC. Uh, previously, a prisoner who had been recalled from HDC was prohibited from obtaining HDC again in the future by virtue of Section 3A, subsection 5 uh, of the 1993 Act. Section 17A, subsection 5, therefore, enables prisoners who had been recalled and had that recall cancelled to obtain HTC again in the future. That prohibition from HTC was repealed in 2016 and to a large extent the repeal has removed the purpose of the section 17A5. Uh, this amendment clarifies that the effect of cancelling a revocation of HTC is not that an individual should be immediately re-released, but rather that they should be reconsidered for release on HTC. Uh, this is a clarification uh, of what we believe was the original no, policy intent uh, of section 17A. Uh, five of the 1993 Act and reflect how it's been operated uh, in practice by SPS. Uh, Amendment 120 is a simple reordering uh, of sections for draft purposing and ease of reference. So I move all the amendments uh, in my name. Yeah. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could clarify if Amendment 115 um, applies to long-term prisoners and therefore everyone um, serving a sentence of four years and more. And in note, he, he, he mentions that this covers the most serious offences and risk management um, is, is mentioned also. So I presume the, the raison d'etre for this is to try and um, eliminate possible risk um, to the public. But if, and perhaps he can confirm this, it covers all long-term sentences of four years and more, it will cover fraud cases where um, potentially the person isn't a threat to the uh, public but would be denied the opportunity to benefit from HDC. And these circumstances, if that is the case, it seems to me that the, the Cabinet Secretary and the Government would be better to um, lay an amendment that spells out specifically the offences, the long-term offences, which they consider should be covered by the legislation. Liam MacArthur. Much can I start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for being very generous in taking uh, interventions. You will have picked up there are uh, some anxieties around uh, 115. The other amendments seem to be um, uh, far more straightforward. I, I suppose the concern I still have, having listened to <clears throat> what the Cabinet Secretary said to, to say, is that uh, the numbers of individuals we're talking about uh, in this regard are extremely small. Um, there will be a variety of reasons for that, but this doesn't appear to be uh, an option that is, uh, is deployed uh, across the board and is very, very specific. And it strikes me it is 
almost certainly that because assessments have been made of the risk of the specific <coughs> circumstances and of the benefits that are delivered in terms of the reintegration of those uh, individuals back into the community and therefore um, I, I would perhaps urge the, the cabinet secretary uh, perhaps at this stage um, not to press 115 to engage in discussions with myself with with colleagues Daniel Johnson with uh, John Finney and, and potentially others to see if we can't find a way of a, a, of allaying the concerns that are quite clearly being expressed here this this morning about um, the, the direction that this amendment uh, takes us in. There will still be an opportunity at stage three, if he wishes to, to bring this back uh, to, the, uh, to the chamber. But at this stage, I, I would hope he would, he would take seriously the concerns that have been expressed uh, and maybe put a pause on this and not move uh, Amendment 115. Daniel Johnson, then Liam Kerr. Um, I'd just like to very much uh, echo what Liam MacArthur has just said. I, I mean, I fully understand and indeed agree with the sentiments that lie behind this in, in terms of needing to fully appreciate the recommendations set out by HMIPS and HMICS. I think they need to uh, have a much more robust approach to, to risk management when it comes to HDC. That all being said, the, the, the end of the time spent in prison is uh, a, a very delicate one. That period after the, the, which someone has come out of prison is a, a very delicate time. And I would suggest that that is even more so in some ways for long-term prisoners. And that the ability to monitor that person and monitor uh, you know, their behaviour and, and where they um, are, are uh, uh, living and so on is a really important uh, function to be able to have. I think sometimes the focus on this area has been too much about shortening the period of time in prison. And that is one element of HDC, but the other point is that monitoring provision, which I think is an important one for long-term uh, prisoners. And I worry that this, um, while I, as I've said, agree with its intent and indeed where it comes from, is going to have unintended consequences. And indeed, in terms of the Cabinet Secretary using the justification of low numbers being used, I, I would even beg the, wonder if that begs the question of whether or not these provisions could and should be being used uh, more, especially for, for longer term prisoners, provide that ex monitoring that I have uh, just outlined. So again, I would just like to reiterate my support for Liam MacArthur's suggestion of engaging with talks uh, to ask the Cabinet Secretary to not press at this time so that we can explore other options for, for pursuing um, Amendment uh, 115. Liam Kerr. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Convener. Just very briefly, I understand entirely the principle uh, of <coughs> the Amendment 115, uh, but I've, I've listened very carefully to that debate, and I think Margaret Mitchell's point, Cabinet Secretary, about the specific crimes and the difference in crimes, I, I'd be very keen to hear an answer to that because I think that was a point well made. Um, I also associate myself with many of the comments that Daniel Johnson's uh, just made, and I do think that Liam MacArthur's suggested way forward might be the sensible one. No one else? Right, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up. Thank you uh, to committee members for the questions and, and, and the debate. I suppose just to, to, to recap and to answer some of the questions uh, once again, um, to answer your question directly, it can be actually we cover all long-term prisoners. So you give the example of somebody who committed a uh, fraud and, and, and sentenced to a long-term sentence of four years or more. Yes, they, they would be included um, but within that. Worth me just reiterating a couple of points. One that, of course, long-term prisoners uh, will uh, will be on on a number of um, uh, will have a number of opportunities to be on rehabilitation courses. Uh, to delve quite deeply into the offence that was committed, the reasons behind that, and to try to change some of their behaviour, which would be different for somebody, for example, on a, on a short sentence, on a particularly, particularly short sentence, that would not be the case. So there are uh, opportunities for, for rehabilitation. Uh, the change would also allow for a focus on short-term prisoners uh, and, and that one set of prisoners, as opposed to a set of arrangements for both short and long. Um, and, and, and as I say, there are there are uh, relatively no numbers. In fact, there's none, no 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 long-term prisoners currently on HCC. Notwithstanding all of that, um, I, I, I can hear what the committee uh, has to say. Um, I've always tried to approach committee uh, with the absolute uh, an, an open mind uh, as possible, and therefore I will take Liam MacArthur's suggestion. I will not press the amendment. I'll engage in conversations uh, with the committee, and we'll come back at stage three to see where we are. Um, that amendment is, is not moved. Uh, we're therefore, the question is that section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I intend to suspend here for a short comfort break of five minutes.
call amendment 135 in the name of Mary Fee and a group of its own, Daniel Johnson, to move and speak to amendment 135. Uh, first of all, can I convey uh, to the committee apologies from Mary Fee. Um, um, she is, this is a topic that she is passionate about, um, and although she is absent, and in some ways I'm very pleased to be able to move this amendment because I think it's an important one. Um, it's often said by people, it's not just the person who serves the, the prison sentence that receives that sentence, their entire family does. And when someone goes into prison, it disrupts all manner of different uh, people that are re related to and live uh, with the, the person that interrupts uh, relationships between husbands and wives, it interrupts relationships between parents and children. The intent of this amendment is to make sure that such considerations are taken fully into account by the Parole Board when it's making its decisions. And I think that is important. I think time and time again, when this committee has been taking evidence or uh, has been on visits um, to both prisons and to charities that, that work in this area, we hear about the impacts that prison sentences can have on families. And I think, therefore, it's only right that the Parole Board takes the holistic uh, decisions that I think that this amendment would ask it to, looking at the imp impact on families and, and taking that into account in its assessments when it's making decisions around uh, parole. So for th those reasons, um, um, I'll, I'm very happy to um, be moving this amendment today. John Finney. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would like to acknowledge the, the considerable work Mary Fee's done in, in this particular matter and, and lend my support to it. I, I think the term victim is sometimes inappropriately used, but it's certainly the case that, uh, that there's victims and prisoners' families and they're, they're uh, victims of a system uh, that often um, are always not of their making. Now, I, I suspect we may be told this is happening anyway, and if that is the case, that's good, but I nonetheless would support it because I think it sends a very clear signal, if it's on the face of the bill here, that uh, there are wider considerations the impact of custodial sentences. So I, I will be supporting this amendment. Okay, Liam MacArthur, then Rona. Uh, thanks very much. And, and like John Finney, can I um, put on record um, my admiration for the work that, that Mary Fee's done uh, alongside families outside on this issue over a number of parliaments uh, now. I, I think similarly, I think the evidence we heard just reinforced the, the fact that uh, the uh, release of a prisoner can have uh, quite profound impacts on uh, the wider uh, family. I suspect that those considerations um, do have a bearing uh, on, on, on these decisions uh, and therefore I think I'd be interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say about the potential downsides of setting this out so explicitly in, in the Bill because from what I can see um, this doesn't appear to be kind of overly rigid um, uh, language used. It's, it's simply, I think, confirming what, as I say, we would assume takes place at the present time. But I'll, I'll listen with interest to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. But for now, I think I'd welcome the fact that Mary Fee has allowed this uh, discussion to take place at stage two. Rona and Fulton. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I'd like to thank Mary Fee for um, uh, introducing this amendment. I agree with you know everything that Daniel said, and it's something I'm very passionate about as well. Um, however, I think for me, the reservation would be the timing of it. I think this will be addressed under the Parole Board review. Um, families outside have, have responded to the consultation, and I know the response will be fully considered. So um, for me, um, right now, I think um, it should be put on hold. I believe it may, may be a probing amendment, but uh, again, um, fully supportive of, of the um, intention of it. Uh, Fulton. Uh, thanks, Convener. And, um, and like others, I want to uh, put on record uh, you know, my, my thoughts that, that Mary Fee has, uh, has done um, remarkable work in this area alongside uh, families outside and like Rona Mackay. It's an area where I'm quite passionate about myself, but I, I do, I do have some concerns at this stage. Um, I don't know if the intention from Mary Fee was was for it just as, as Liam MacArthur said to get a discussion going around it, and for something else to come back at stage three. But I'd like a bit more uh, discussion, a bit more meat on the bones around, um, you know, the, the effects on perhaps licence conditions, but there's maybe a, a, an exclusion zone in place, perhaps vulnerable, uh, vulnerable family members. Um, and things like that, but, but I certainly agree with the principle of the of the amendment. Um, but I think it needs a wee bit more work and teasing out before being in a position to vote for it. 
No one else. Uh, I'm happy to support this amendment, which covers the impact that a prison sentence can undoubtedly have on the wider family. And I, I really want to take this opportunity to, to acknowledge and commend uh, the excellent work that Mary Fee has done on this issue. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, <coughs> Convener. Can I also add my um, thanks to Diane Johnson for moving this, but also place on record uh, the credit uh, to, to Mary Fee, who has been a long-standing advocate uh, for the rights um, of families uh, outside, both as an organisation, but indeed families outside, um, families of prisoners uh, more generally in the wider society. And the work that she's done in the cross-party group is also uh, worth commending as well. Uh, Mary Fee's uh, amendment, <coughs> as we know, seeks to amend the Prisoners and Criminal Proceeding Act 1993 to create a new section uh, 1ZAA to provide that the Pro Board must assess and take into account the impact on a prisoner's family when making recommendations on the release of a prisoner, including any recommendation as to the conditions of release. <coughs> as others um, have uh, already alluded to, my concerns around this amendment are the fact that it would be on the face of the bill. Uh, I believe the provisions in this amendment would be misplaced on the face of the 1993 Act and be much more appropriate in the Pro Board Scotland Rules 2001. That is consistently uh, where our, as the name would suggest, the rules uh, governing issues in our own parole are located for that flexibility and to ensure there is not the rigidity that often primary legislation brings with it. I recently met with Nancy Lukes. Um, the Chief Executive for Families Outside, and we discussed some of the issues faced by prisoners' families. Uh, I can understand some of the problems they face. I'm very sympathetic to their views. Uh, however, as Rona Mackay has already mentioned, the consultation transforming parole in Scotland, which closes, uh, which closed, I should say, on the 27th of March, included proposals to provide additional support to um, prisons, uh, prisoners uh, in the parole process, um, but also uh, asked questions about whether or not uh, we should uh, look at matters surrounding the family of prisoners as well. We're currently considering responses to the consultation, including responses, of course, from families outside um, and, and some other responses which advocate the consideration of a prisoner's family should be taken into account when the Pro Board are considering release. Um, as such, I can offer absolute assurances that the provision of assistance to prisoners and issues relating to their families will be fully considered in light of responses to the consultation. Um, uh, we will be amending the Pro Board uh, Rules 2001 uh, as part of the implementation of this bill. Um, we can take the opportunity to also look at the, point being the points being raised uh, at that time um, as well. Um, so I would ask that the amendment is not pressed, but if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject the amendment. Daniel Johnson to wind up, press or withdraw. Uh, I mean, I'll just briefly wind up. I, mean, I, I hear the, 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 the comments that have been made both in terms of uh, the need for detail and uh, questions regarding whether or not this is the correct place to put it. However, I would just point out to members that this is a, a broadly stated um, uh, amendment. It's one that pr uh, essentially makes provision for a broad consideration. It does not have detail. And actually, and indeed, I think in many situations, and I think this is one, that is a, a positive advantage because it provides flexibility. It certainly does not preclude um, further amendments um, such as the, the Cabinet Secretary has laid out. What it does do, though, is make sure that such considerations are, are taking place. So for those reasons, I think that, that, that um, the, the, the the broad nature of this means that I think it is uh, uh, measured and sensible and in line with many of the things that we're looking at. Um, and indeed, I think the very fact that there, there is potential further legislation on the Pro Board coming forward means that further detail can be looked at, but this, this puts um, that, that uh, legal duty firmly in place. So for those reasons, I'll be pressing the amendment. The question is that Amendment 135 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Oh, we're not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Are there any abstentions? 
Right, there are four in favour, four against, one abstention, uh, one abstention, and I use my casting vote in favour of Amendment 135, which is now agreed. Call Amendment 116 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendment 117, Cabinet Secretary to move, 116 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Section 41 of the Bill amends Section 17.4 of the Prisoners and Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act 1993 to remove the word immediate to extend to all directions in respect of the release after recall to prison and replace it with the, word, uh, with the words, quote, without undue delay. Uh, as a consequence of the amendments in, uh, amendment in Section 41 of the Bill, it is necessary to amend Section 10A to remove the word immediately from that section. Uh, amendment uh, 116 will achieve that objective. Uh, amendment 117 is part of a tidying up of the operation of the licence recall uh, stroke revocation system. Currently, the reasons for recalling a prisoner from a period of early or temporary release are provided on recall or on return to custody. The change made by this amendment will introduce a standard requirement and a more consistent operation of the system to recall whereby the reasons for a prisoner's recall to prison from parole, HDC or temporary release are provided on the prisoner's return to prison. Uh, this also ensures that a failure to provide reasons at the time of recall from parole does not impact on the ability to recall the prisoner to prison in what may be very urgent circumstances. Uh, I move Amendment 116 in my name. Do members have any comments? Okay. The question is that Amendment 116 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 117 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 116. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 117 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Yeah. Uh, the question is that Section 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 128 in the name of Daniel Johnson, a group on its own. Daniel Johnson to move and speak to Amendment 128. Thank you, Convener. Uh, this amendment stems from a, a, a fundamental uh, principle uh, and, and one that I think is, is really important, which is uh, transparency in terms of the exercise of the law. I think that this is an important principle uh, in, a, in a, a great number of areas when it comes to the criminal justice system, um, but I think in particular the, the parole board. Um, and in this particular instance, I think what is important is that it, it is important for uh, the, the, the reasons uh, for decisions being made to be well understood by the public. Understood by the public both in terms of the source of those decisions um, and the criteria that are applied in the decision-making process, but also in terms of the, the decisions themselves. And that's what this amendment seeks to do. It seeks to uh, 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 require the Pro Board to do two things. Um, first of all, to uh, devise and publish um, a test or series of factors that it uses um, and take it, takes into account when making um, its decisions and making its recommendations. And uh, similarly, to then uh, uh, publish, albeit with modifications and redactions where appropriate, um, the uh, summaries of its recommendations that it makes. And I think these are important steps in terms of improving the transparency of the Pro Board. Indeed, um, of course. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, but I have an open mind in this. I, I want to try and understand. But talk about openness and transparency and also redactions. What do you anticipate may be redacted or the general nature of what might be redacted? Um, I thank the member for that intervention and I think it's an important one. Um, I, I mean, in part uh, because of one of the, the, the previous amendments that, that we've already accepted, there's a great number of factors and considerations that the Pro Board may take into account, which may involve other individuals whose privacies uh, is, 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 is important. Um, I, I think it would be uh, an unfortunate a consequence of, of this if uh, the public publication of decisions or a summary of those decisions compromise uh, individuals' privacy who have committed no crime themselves, but nonetheless um, their circumstances are material or relevant 
to whether or not uh, somebody uh, may be uh, being released on parole. Um, you know, the, 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 the associations and relationships that that individual might have are relevant to parole decisions and therefore I think it's important that the Parole Board has the ability to, to redact information um, when uh, such considera considerations are at play. Um, uh, it, it, uh, just, I mean, so really, just to sort of uh, round off, th this is a, a, in some ways, a, a brief and, and a straightforward amendment. And again, I think that is important. I think it is important that we are not overly prescriptive in terms of black letter law, um, what uh, these uh, tests or factors uh, uh, should be. I think that is a matter to be determined by the parole board itself. However, I think that the fact that they're published makes that that will, it will be an open and transparent uh, process. Um, uh, 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 and uh, uh, indeed, I hope that this is an important step forward in terms of improving some of the, the issues which arose um, uh, around the, the War Boys case, where in particular these issues um, came into question in terms of the nature of the decision making of the Pro Board uh, in England and Wales and why they had made the particular decisions that they had. Now, I understand the operation of the Pro Board in England and Wales is substantially different to that in Scotland, but nonetheless, I think those questions. I, I think it's not difficult to conceive of circumstances where they could arise uh, in Scotland. And I think this step uh, will improve that transparency and hopefully help us avoid any uh, similar situations or circumstances in Scotland. Uh, to move amendment 128. Uh, moved. Move moved. Okay. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thanks very much. Can I thank Daniel Johnson um, both for uh, lodging the amendment and, and setting out uh, clearly the in intention uh, behind it. I think the, the point he makes in relation to transparency is, is uh, absolutely a, 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 a pivotal one in terms of securing uh, public uh, confidence. A, a little like John Finney, I, I recognise that the, the reference to modifications and, and, and redactions, I think is Daniel Johnson's uh, reasonable attempt um, to accommodate um, the, the, the restrictions on that transparency that would be required. I have to say it wouldn't simply, to, to my mind, be um, in, in instances relating to, to third parties uh, whose details uh, would require to be redacted. I think there would be details in relation to the, the individuals themselves uh, which may not be um, uh, appropriate to, to release into the, into the public domain. I, I suppose, a little like John Finney, I, came to this amendment with an open mind. My anxieties are that uh, we have a, a consultation on the parole board at the moment where I think this debate is absolutely germane and would, I wish to see it picked up, whether in the 2001 rules that the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary referred to uh, earlier, um, I'm, I'm, I'm less certain. Um, but nevertheless, I think the point about increasing public confidence through a greater transparency is a, is, is a point well made and therefore I think the amendment in that sense um, has, served a, has served a useful purpose. Thank you. Okay. No other members, um, I'm certainly minded to support this amendment uh, which would lead to, to greater uh, transparency in the parole process and, and that's most certainly to be welcomed. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Just to pick up on, on, on that very point, uh, you know, the, the, the openness, transparency of the Pro Board uh, certainly is an issue and I have spoken to a number of families, indeed the, 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 the families of victims, uh, they tell me time and time again that they wish to see greater openness, greater transparency. I think that would be reflected in conversations every single committee member here uh, has had. So I am committed to an absolutely open and transparent uh, parole board, uh, and I consider that the amendments put forward by Daniel Johnson certainly go some way in achieving that aim, um, and I'm supportive of what he is trying to do. Uh, I would be willing to work with uh, Daniel Johnson to assist him to bring forward an amendment at stage three, which provides uh, for the parole board to publish the test uh, or factors it takes into account when making a recommendation. However, my, my concerns would be that I would, I would ask that you would re remove the requirement to provide a summary of recommendations. I consider that it's very much a matter more appropriate for the Pro Board Rules of Procedures, uh, already referenced, and one which has also been raised in the recent consultation, which has also been uh, referenced. I have also some concerns in the technical uh, detail or, or, or lack thereof uh, that have been referenced by, I think, both John Finney actually and by Lee MacArthur in relation to the redaction of information, but I don't think any of this, uh, I have to say, is particularly insurmountable. So I would ask uh, Daniel Johnson not to press um, his amendment um, and, and to work uh, with the government to come forward at stage three with an amendment 
that fulfils the general aims of what he's trying to do, with that perhaps one exception about the requirements to provide a summary of recommendations, which I have some, some reservations around. Daniel Johnson, to wind up, press or withdraw. Um, I, I'd just like to thank members for their constructive uh, comments um, and, and, and also the, the Cabinet Secretary and I, th I thank everyone for, uh, I think, acknowledging the, the intent behind this. Um, and on, on the basis of what has been said and also what the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary has offered, I will be uh, withdrawing this uh, and I look forward to working on uh, coming up with a, a revised amendment at Stage 3. So I'll withdraw the amendment. Is committee content that Daniel withdraws this amendment? They are content. Thank you. Call Amendment 118 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 115. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 118 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call Amendment 119 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with, the with Amendment 115. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call amendment 120 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with amendment 115. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 120 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Call amendment 79 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst in, in a group on its own. Gordon Lindhurst to move and speak to amendment 79. Thank you, convener. The, the purpose of this amendment is to ensure proper representation is available to vulnerable prisoners at parole board hearings. Um, there appears to be a certain lacuna or gap in the legislation at present. Now, um, this, the drafting of this amendment, submission of it, um, and a letter, in fact, on this from the Cabinet Secretary and the consultation, I think, with the Scottish Government on parole matters, transforming parole in Scotland, which closed on 27th March 2019, um, happened more or less simultaneously and I think could be said to have crossed in the post would be the old-fashioned expression. So um, I, I'm thankful to the Cabinet Secretary for the letter that he sent me on this matter, indicating that he is... Uh, wishing to consider matters further in light of the, the consultation which has just closed and perhaps uh, he might wish to make some comments uh, first, uh, or sorry, at this stage, convener, if you're so minded to allow. Okay. Um, is it being moved? Uh, no. uh, can you move Amendment 79? Uh, I'll move the amendment. Thank you. Do members have any comments? Um, this certainly seems to me very... Uh, sensible uh, on the face of it, but interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. Uh, John Finney, then Dan, uh, Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I, I think there's a very fundamental principle here that uh, is worthy of uh, support and hopefully will be picked up by the Scottish Government. I mean, you would imagine it must be fundamental that everyone involved in a process under, understands the process. If that's not the case, then clearly it's not a, a, a fair process. So I hope that issue would be addressed and I thank the member for bringing it forward. Daniel? Uh, I'd just like to briefly say that I, 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 I very much agree with what John Finney has just said. I think this is a very sensible and, and, and progressive suggestion, and I look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary says and, and seeing how this uh, uh, proposal can be um, uh, forwarded. Liam MacArthur? don't want to delay things much, uh, can be other than to echo what uh, Daniel and, uh, and John have, have just said. I think it, the, the crossing in the post uh, may be the, uh, the, 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 the issue we need to get round, but um, I would hope the Cabinet Secretary can offer um, some reassurance in, in regard to how this will be uh, dealt with going forward. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Can I thank Gordon Lindhurst for his uh, constructive approach to this? He's um, not just written to me on, on this, but approached me um, about how to take forward uh, an issue which I think absolutely has substance and, and, and absolutely has um, merit uh, as well, no doubt, uh, from his considerable uh, experience before uh, being an MSP, of course, uh, as well. Uh, this amendment refers to matters relating to the procedures, uh, the procedure the Probe Board undertakes when considering a case. Um, pro board proceedings are, as I've said, a number of amendments set out in rules made by Scottish ministers under Section 24 of the Criminal Prisoner and Criminal Proceedings Act 1993. As rules of procedure, they may require amendment to deal with new eventualities or indeed to adapt to changing circumstances. It's for these reasons that rules of procedures are set out 
in secondary legislation. Uh, I'm concerned that the approach adopted in this amendment would perhaps have a detrimental impact on the ability to amend procedures of the Pro Board and, and those rules in the future. If accepted, the amendment would result in part of the Pro Board procedure being provided in primary legislation, while the remainder of it would be provided in secondary legislation and the Pro Board rules. The result of this would be that, as I say, any further change to the provisions set out in this amendment would require further act of the Scottish Parliament rather than being able to um, be taken forward via secondary legislation. So, uh, in this instance, I remain very much of the view that it's entirely appropriate that matters of procedure for the Pro Board should be provided for by secondary legislation. Uh, again, it provides us with the speed, the flexibility to change aspects uh, of Pro Board procedure at a quicker pace. Um, and, and as I say, it should be in, in, in the rules as opposed to in the face of this bill. Um, I, I do agree that the proposal um, absolutely has uh, some merit, but I would prefer uh, to gain an understanding of how the appointment of a curator ad litem, ad, ad litem uh, would work, how that impacts on prisoners appearing before tribunals uh, who are already entitled to assistance by way of representation. And perhaps uh, uh, if, if, if Gordon Lintus is not minded to, 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 to press it, then I can give him further information uh, on what that support uh, for vulnerable uh, prisoners uh, look like in relation to parole uh, hearing. Um, the number of members have referenced the consultation uh, that is currently ongoing, uh, sorry, that is closed on parole uh, just last month. Um, and, and I can uh, give an absolute guarantee uh, that the issue that Gordon Lindhurst raises uh, will be part of our consideration when it comes to consultation um, uh, analysis. There are a few technical um, issues as well I would have with the amendment, but um, I don't think I need to go into any great detail uh, in some, uh, in, into those technical issues. So I would ask that Gordon Lindhurst doesn't press the amendment works with me uh, after this uh, committee meeting to have a discussion around what is in the consultation and will be a result of the consultation for the rules uh, of parole board uh, hearings uh, and then we can take uh, matters forward thereafter and if he's not satisfied of course he can bring forward his amendment uh, thereafter at stage three. Gordon Lindhurst to wind up, press or withdraw. Um, in light of the minister's commitments I'm not going to press the amendment at this stage. Uh, amendment uh, 79 is not pressed. The question is that section 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call amendment 121, name of the cabinet secretary, grouped with amendment 122, 122A, 122B, 122C, 122D and 123. Cabinet secretary to move amendment 121 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I, I uh, will speak to, but I, I move amend all the amendments uh, in my name. Uh, Scottish Government amendments in this group, uh, 121, 122 and 23, relate to persons unlawfully at large. Uh, they're brought forward as part of the Scottish Government's response to the recommendations from um, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland. The proposals that the Scottish Government have brought forward provide a new and additional punitive element for those that remain unlawfully at large and also address the question of powers of entry for the police, before I go into the substance of the detail, convener, uh, can I put on record certainly my admiration for uh, the, McC the McClellan family, who <laughs> I've met uh, and listened to on a number uh, of occasions. We have uh, our differences, absolutely, and they will be the first uh, to tell you such. Uh, but that does not, for a minute, take away uh, my admiration uh, for them. In fact, this offence and the subsequent changes to the HDC regime, of course, as I have said, are a result of the inspector reports uh, in the aftermath of that uh, terrible tragedy. Um, amendment 121 uh, is a more technical amendment uh, in this grouping. Part 15 of the Prisons and Young Offenders Institution Scotland Rules 2011 provides a regime of temporary release for prisoners. Uh, temporary release is considered to be a form of release and licence. In practice, uh, and prisoners are issued with a temporary release licence with licence conditions. However, temporary release is not referred to as a form of release on licence in the Prisoners uh, Scotland Act 1989 or the Prison Rules. Uh, Amendment 121 simply clarifies that temporary release is a form of release on licence. Uh, this will mean that there can be a consistency in approach on how we refer to parole, HDC and temporary release uh, throughout the bill. They will all be forms of release uh, on licence. The substantive amendment uh, 122 creates the offence of remaining unlawfully at large. An offender can currently be unlawfully enlarged in any one of the following circumstances, uh, where the offender remains at large after being recalled from HDC, uh, where the offender remains at large after being recalled from parole by ministers, either with or without parole board recommendation, where the offender remains at large after being recalled from temporary release by the governor, 
and the offender fails to return to prison on the expiry of a period of temporary release. The policy intention is to mirror the offence in England and Wales and create an offence of being unlawfully at large and failing to return as soon as reasonably practicable. It is important to stress that following the creation of an unlawfully at large offence, there would be two aspects of being unlawfully at large. Firstly, the recall of a prisoner to prison or the expiry of a period of temporary release means that the prisoner <coughs> is unlawfully at large and can be arrested without warrant. When a prisoner is recalled to prison, the prisoner needs to be aware of the recall order to, the, to be unlawfully at large. Secondly, if a prisoner who is unlawfully at large fails to return to prison as soon as reasonably practicable, the prisoner would commit an offence. The offence would be committed where the prisoner fails to return to prison as soon as reasonably practicable, uh, <coughs> after being notified of the recall or after the expiry of a period of temporary release. The unlawfully at large offence does not cover electronic monitoring imposed by a court in a community sentence. An offender can't be unlawfully at large under a community sentence. When a, an offender breaches the terms of a community sentence, the court already has an ability to vary the sentence, impose a fine, or return people to custody if deemed appropriate. The unlawfully at large offence is framed so as to provide the offender with a number of defences to a charge of remaining unlawfully at large. Uh, for example, they had a reasonable excuse for the delay, they were not notified or the notification was not properly effected, the return was as soon as possible in the circumstances, or although they failed to return to prison, they took all reasonable steps to return. Yes. Just by way of clarity, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, on, in terms of that notification, uh, I, I saw that there was uh, some detail about this, but just what does it mean to be notified? Because by definition, if someone's unlawfully at large, they may well not be at a premises or a location where uh, they'd otherwise been expected to be. Yeah, so the, there's kind of two safeguards, both an oral and, and, a, and a written notification. Uh, you know, in practice, uh, an address would be given for where that individual is, uh, is to be located during the period of HTC, so the curfew period. Uh, and of course, every attempt would be made to get that notification uh, out to them. Um, the reasonable kind of excuse uh, for the delays and the points that I've just made and in, 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 in the bullet points that I've just mentioned, um, you know, they, they, they are there for, you know, the absolute exceptional, you would think, uh, reasons why somebody would not uh, receive a, a notification in the vast majority of instances if somebody uh, somebody has to have a recall notice, then um, uh, I've seen it actually. I'm sure he's been to the, the G4S centre too, where, uh, you know, and in the first instance, an oral notification uh, would potentially be given. Uh, but if not, then that would also be followed up by, by a written notification. So there are safeguards uh, in place. As I say, these exceptions that I'm talking about are, I would imagine, and, and it would, would be uh, the exception as opposed to, 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 to the rule. Uh, if I, I see his eyebrow raised, he may wish to, to come back on these matters, but I, I'll, I'll come forward. I'm Cabinet Secretary. Of course. Just, uh, I understand the point being made entirely. Uh, I'm just not necessarily persuaded because I'm running a scenario that says if, <coughs> if I am the one to be recalled, I have a defence if you have been unable, not you obviously, but if, if the, the authorities have not been able to notify me in accordance with the legislation that I am to be recalled, and therefore, if I can structure a set of circumstances where you are unable to notify me, uh, then I can avail myself of the defence. And that feels a bit odd to me. Not, not quite the case, so I'll, I'll just give some clarification and perhaps uh, maybe I wasn't as clear uh, in, my, in, 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 in what I just said a minute ago. But um, it's about um, being deemed notified. So even if you weren't at the premises, which you should be at, because remember, you know, there's a curfew on you. Seven to seven generally tends to be the case. There's a curfew uh, on you. You should be at that premises. Um, a written notification is then left at that premises. Even if you have not received it and say that you have not received it, you have been notified because you should have been at that address at that period of time. So hopefully that gives them a little bit more reassurance on, 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 on that point. So this is not uh, uh, an, an, an exception. So I'm, I'm obviously open to members uh, wishing to come back for further clarification. Yes, of course. I just I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for, for giving way. I mean, again, one of the other scenarios which has cropped up is people giving an address that's outside of Scotland. Could the Cabinet Secretary perhaps um, clarify what, what would happen in the circumstance that someone gives uh, an address in another part of the UK? One of the recommendations of the Inspectorate reports was that this issue 
had to be uh, looked at and, and, and a more res robust regime in place between interagency communication. I think all of us will remember that, that and, and I can clarify that there is now a point of contact with every single one of the forces in England and Wales, uh, which previously didn't exist for this particular issue. Um, but it would be up to the force in question in England and Wales to give forward that notification. Now, the offence we're creating mirrors the offence in England and Wales. So you would think that the forces in England and Wales actually would have necessarily more experience, but certainly would be aware of, 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 of what we're trying to do, but, but also in some, some practical experience of, of what we're trying to do. But it's, I think the important point to give Daniel Johnson the reassurance is, is that there is now a point of contact within every single uh, police service uh, in, in England and Wales that previously didn't exist. Uh, if there's no other interventions, I'll make uh, some more progress uh, on, on, on this uh, amendment. Um, I suppose the advantages of the unlawfully at large uh, offence are as follows. It would enable the police um, to apply for a warrant to enter and search a property to apprehend a person suspected of committing an offence um, using powers in Section 1 of the Criminal Justice uh, Scotland uh, Act 2016. It provides a criminal sanction which could act as a deterrent for this behaviour. Uh, this would sit alongside other sanctions that exist whereby the uh, unlawfully at large offenders return to prison and require to serve out the remainder of their sentence, but also serve a period equivalent to the time spent unlawfully at large. Um, it reduces the need for further offences, um, such as we've discussed before, such as cutting off a tag or breaching licence conditions in general, as anyone who breaches the licence conditions can be recalled and their failure to return thereafter would be a criminal offence. For the amendment um, one, two, three, uh, once an offender is unlawfully at large, the police or a prison officer can arrest the offender without warrant under section 40 of the 1989 Act. Um, there is a statutory power in section 40A of the 1989 Act to apply for a warrant to arrest an offender who is unlawfully at large. Uh, however, section 40A does not make it clear who can apply for a warrant or whether the warrant could include a power of entry and search. So accordingly, we are proposing uh, to amend section 40A of the 1989 Act to make clear that uh, the police can apply and only the police can apply for a warrant under that section and that the warrant will include a power to enter and search premises to locate an offender who is unlawfully at large. Uh, we believe this will address the situation that was referred to in the inspectorate's report in relation to a lack of clarity around the responsibility for obtaining a warrant under section 40A. I also know it was an issue that was raised with me by the McClelland family on a number of occasions. Of course, I'll take intervention. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. Um, just in, in relation to 123, the, the wording in subsection 3 refers to conferring a power on a constable using such force as the constable considers necessary. My, my understanding is that um, the use of reasonable force is the standard language in those circumstances, rather than implying uh, a level of discretion on, the, uh, on either the individual constable or on the police more generally. I just wonder whether um, you might reflect on, on the wording of that um, uh, ahead of stage three and see whether or not there, there may be an amendment that's needed there. No, I'm happy to reflect on, on, on that wording. I think Lee MacArthur, for raising it, wasn't an issue uh, that, that, that had been raised with me before, so I'll reflect on, on that point. Um, Amendment 123, I should say, also tidies up some of the language uh, used in Section 40 of the 1989 Act uh, and in Section 93 of the 1993 Act to make it clear that the warrant procedures in Section 40 of the 1989 Act apply to all offenders uh, who are unlawfully at large. If I turn to Amendments uh, 122A to C, um, I cannot support these amendments from Daniel Johnson. Uh, I propose to resist them on the basis that they would restrict the ability of the court to determine how best to respond to the offence. Uh, the effect is unduly punitive, restricts the discretion of the courts to consider the circumstances before them uh, and to sentence accordingly. Um, uh, I have to say it is an unusually uh, regressive proposal uh, from someone who I know uh, only to be a progressive uh, on such matters. So, um, Custody is uh, already one of the options they can consider at a time where we have the highest prison population in Western Europe and where our prisons are operating so close to capacity removing at least the option for the court to consider non-custodial disposals in any situation needs carefully thought. I'm not convinced that this is the right approach. Uh, I'd also note that amendments 122A to 122C would remove the ability of the courts to impose a prison sentence alongside a fine in cases where the severity of the offence merits such a penalty. The related amendment 122D is unnecessary as there are existing legislative provisions covering the issue which uh, Daniel Johnson seeks to address here. In addition, the replication of existing legislation 
could cause confusion as to which particular provision should apply in a given case. When an offender commits an offence punishable by imprisonment while serving a previous sentence of imprisonment in the community, Section 16 of the 1993 Act enables that previous sentence to be restated by the court and the sentence for the new offence to be imposed consecutively. This enables the court to provide that the time between the commission of the unlawfully at large offence and the imposition of a further prison sentence for the unlawfully at large offence is to be served as a separate prison sentence. Uh, section 40, subsection 2 of the 1989 Act provides that time spent absent from prison without lawful authority um, does not count as time served towards the underlying prison sentence. This removes any need uh, for Amendment 122D as the time that a prisoner spends uh, uh, unlawfully at large will require to be served by that prisoner when they are returned to prison. Um, amendment 122D would therefore create confusion. As I say, it replicates legislative provisions already in force, so I would urge Daniel Johnson not to press this amendment. I move Amendment 121 in my name. Daniel Johnson to speak to Amendment 122A and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, can I say at the outset that, in, in broad terms, I support um, the uh, provision of this new offence. I think it's uh, an important one for the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary set out. Um, the, the Craig McClelland uh, 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 murder, I think, established that there were deficiencies in uh, both the way that the HDC was being operated, uh, but also uh, critically in terms of the powers that the police had. And I think, importantly, that point around uh, the warrant to enter premises uh, was a key point that came out of those circumstances. So therefore, I, I welcome um, the introduction um, of this offence. I think it is a, a, a positive step forward. However, I do uh, think it's important that this offence has teeth, and that is essentially what my uh, uh, amendments seek to do. Um, in in, in uh, short, what this seeks to do is to uh, 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 have the effect of when someone is unlawfully at large, that time spent is added on to the time that they serve in prison. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary um, said that it's an unusually regressive proposal coming for someone that normally um, espouses progressive uh, 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 proposals in criminal justice. And, and, I, I, and I, I, let, let me reply to him in, in this way. And I am someone that t tries to be progressive. However, uh, I have a very firm pr uh, principle, which is this, is that the criminal justice system must absolutely provide people with the opportunity and the ability to reform and rehabilitate. But when they do not take those opportunities, and when they breach the, the, the uh, opportunities that have been extended to them, that they must also then face the consequences. And this is exactly what this, uh, these set of amendments seek to do. That, that, that when someone is on HDC, when they are out on TAG, they are out on TAG, they are on HDC, as an alternative to prison, as an alternative to time spent in prison. So when they breach those conditions and when they, 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 they take, uh, when they spend time unlawfully at large, I think it's important that there's a direct consequence of that. And I think that does mean that they have to return to prison because this is an alternative prison and they are breaking the conditions uh, that have been set out in, in, in front of them. Absolutely. Okay. Will the member take an intervention? I wonder, in relation to the Cabinet Secretary's point about removing judicial discretion effectively, could you comment on that? Please. I, I mean, I, I think we do need to be cautious about inception, but this is not an, a, a, you know, a, an isolated example. I mean, I think the, the law in a number of situations sets out clearly what uh, you know, uh, penalties that should be afforded. And this has a very simple idea that the time spent unlawfully at large, that time that, that someone is in, in breach, gets added on. And really, it's stipulating both that, but also that, that alternatives, non-custodial alternatives, are not acceptable uh, uh, in the circumstances that someone breaches the conditions of their HDC. And I think because an HDC is essentially an alternative prison, I think that, that, that that's a, a sound principle. I'm happy to take an intervention from Liam Kerr. Yeah, I'm grateful to Daniel Johnson on this. Um, I'm, I'm actually broadly sympathetic um, to, to, to the amendments that he's making, particularly A and D. Um, but on B and C, I do hear the Cabinet Secretary's point. I, um, could he explain why he's removed the ability to fine as an alternative? Because that does sound rather um, harsh. Because 
for, for the simple reason that I think that, that the public's confidence in HDC and how it operates and the consequences when pe people breach has been um, severely shaken. And I think what this does is provide a very simple and understandable set of consequences for when people breach HDC. Then the simple consequence is this, is that if you breach, the time you spend unlawfully at large will be added on to your sentence. And, it, and it's that simplicity and clarity which I think will help re-establish confidence in the HDC regime. And that's, that's why I've made those, those proposals. Happy to. I, just I was about to close them. I just wonder, though, if the member, hey, thanks very much for taking the intervention, if the member thinks that there's a possibility here that he's trying to legislate for what would possibly be appropriate for the case that he references, but may not be appropriate for all cases. I, I, I struggle to conceive of circumstances whereby I think that, that, that you, if someone breaches HDC, that alternative to prison that returning them to prison isn't the appropriate thing to do. I mean, it, 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 HDC is put in place in lieu of someone serving time in prison. And therefore, I think because of those circumstances, because of that, that simplicity, and I think also because it is an easily understood proposition and consequence, I, I think um, it, it, it is, uh, those are the reasons that I'm, I'm making uh, these proposals and these amendments. So I'll finish there. Any other members have any comments? Liam MacArthur? Um, just very briefly, uh, convener, I, mean, I welcome the, um, the, the general direction of the government's amendments in this section. I think it does pick up uh, concerns that were raised with us throughout the, um, uh, the consideration at stage one of this uh, bill, and, and notably around the concerns arising from the tragic events uh, uh, surrounding Craig McClellan's uh, murder. I think I alluded in the intervention to the Cabinet Secretary um, to uh, a, a drafting uh, anomaly in, in relation to 123. I think similarly with, um, with 122 as well, uh, there have been concerns raised with me by the, the Law Society about um, some of the language uh, used, and it's a concern in relation to um, uh, um, uh, proper notice uh, orally or in writing as opposed to orally and uh, in writing. I think that the concern being that persons who are going on temporary um, uh, release are not necessarily fully understanding of the, the, the details of their licence. And again, it might be worth engaging with the Law Society ahead of stage three uh, on the basis of those concerns. Similarly, um, I think in the same uh, subsection two, there's a reference to individuals being warned as opposed to advised. And again, that um, uh, that uh, language strikes a, a slightly uh, discordant uh, note. Um, I think there are anxieties too about the way in which um, the, the, the language is used about um, the nature of the uh, fixed address um, and the implications that, that that might have. So I think none of this detracts from, um, I think, the, the value of, of, of these amendments and the improvements they'll deliver through this bill. But um, I think if, if the Law Society are raising um, these sorts of uh, concerns around um, the, the, the drafting, I would hope that those could be picked up. Um, by the uh, by, the cabinet secretary and his officials ahead of stage three. But uh, on the basis of, of what he said, I'll certainly be supporting his amendments. Yeah, um, Liam Kerr. Thanks, convener. Uh, to take it in reverse order, it, I, I thought that was a very interesting debate, and I've, I've thought carefully about how I'm going to go on this. Um, I am persuaded by Daniel Johnson's argument on this, uh, because and, and particularly around this simplicity. Uh, and clarity. And, and it's for that reason that, uh, and I say this genuinely respectfully, Cabinet Secretary, but uh, I don't think it's helpful to talk about labels, to, to, to talk about progressive amendments or not, because I, whilst I am going to support the government's amendments on this, I, I don't think they go far enough. And I don't say that because I'm not in some way not progressive. I say that because I genuinely believe the right thing to do on this uh, is to go where my original Amendment 73 uh, was going, making it an automatic criminal offence to cut off or tamper with the tag. And I'm, I will be bringing that forward again at, um, at Stage 3, and I, I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to consider it very carefully at that stage. But So I will be supporting the Cabinet Secretary on this, on the, the Amendments uh, 121 to 123, uh, but I, I would like it on record. I don't think it goes far enough. Uh, and I look forward to trying to push further at the next stage. Yeah. Just addressing um, Daniel Johnson's amendment, and he said at the outset that he thought it was important that unlawfully at large has real teeth, 
and I agree with that. Um, public confidence has been absolutely shaken in, in the home detention curfew um, provision and adding time to a sentence where there has been a breach would, in my view, be a real deterrent, which would not be provided, as the Cabinet suggested, and the Cabinet uh, Secretary suggested, with a fine. So for these reasons, I'd be absolutely minded to support these amendments. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for what has been a very useful and, and, and helpful discussion. I suppose just a couple of points. So we'll, we'll pick up on the points that Liam MacArthur made around some of the drafting. Uh, I haven't seen the Lost Society note, but um, I'm sure we can get a, a copy of it and uh, we can have a look at some of those potential anomalies so we will reflect uh, on those points. Um, just going back to, to, to Daniel Johnson's uh, amendments, I just think things are being done perhaps in, in, in the wrong order. The, the amendments we're bringing forward do, do not prevent a custodial sentence uh, being imposed by the courts because of an unlawfully at large uh, offence. That is at the discretion of the courts, which it absolutely should be. Uh, what your amendments are doing are, 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 are not allowing for any other alternative to necessarily be uh, considered. And for me, that is, is, is the wrong way uh, round. There may be some reflection on the fact that the Conservative member suggests he's being almost too, too punitive. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, you know, I would, um, I'll leave that for him to reflect. And on, on Liam Kerr's points, um, of course, uh, in previous sessions, I've, I've, I've articulated why I think um, the cutting off of the tag in itself uh, is, is creating, make, making that an offence in itself um, is, is not wise, because there are other licence conditions and we're creating a hierarchy here as opposed to, to, to an unlawful a large offence, which I think is, is the right way. Um, to, to, to go, and I will also ask him to reflect on this issue about not labelling people when the next time I see a press release from him that talks about hard or soft justice. I will remind him of that point. Um, but nonetheless... Um, it's not on that point. <laughs> of course I will. <laughs> but I enjoyed the intervention. That, that, the, the, the point being made, that was amusing. Um, the point about the cutting off the tag, if I might go back to that, and I appreciate that's not what we're discussing right now, but just after the last session's discussion, uh, I, I seem to recall the Cabinet Secretary wasn't there on my Amendment 73 as much because he said, look, people could cut off the tag for legitimate reasons. And I just wonder, and I, I, I won't expect him to answer this now, but if he could come, come back to me with information on data as to how many tags have been cut off for reasons that are... Uh, medical, perhaps. The, the, the full range of reasons as to why tags are being cut off before we come to stage three. I, I suspect, I don't have the data in front of me, of course, I'll, I'll look into it, I suspect the number would be extraordinarily low, and I suspect that's the point he's trying to make. But the point of law is such that, you know, we have to factor in what would be the anomaly. Uh, and that is why we have things like reasonable excuses, etc., etc. So I suspect the number will be extraordinarily low. I think the second point I was trying to make, and, and I won't go into too much detail because it's not what we're debating, is that, you know, why would that particular breach of the condition, i.e. cutting off the tag, is that worse than, for example, somebody approaching a school when they're not meant to, which is also a licence condition that they may well have? And if not, then why is the approaching of the school, which is a breach of the licence condition, not an offence, but the cutting off in a ta of a tag is? So there's questions around there, but I, look, I'll, I'll reflect. I mean, Liam Kerr said already he's going to bring this forward. Uh, says, I will reflect carefully once he has lodged that amendment uh, on what that amendment says. But I would just ask him to take those points on, on, on board and reflect on them before he brings it forward again. OK, the question is Amendment <coughs> 121 be agreed to or are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call Amendment 122 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with the man Amendment 121. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Call Amendment 122A in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 121. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. Right. The question is that Amendment 122A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Three in favour, six against. Amendment um, 122A is not agreed. Call Amendment 122B in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 121. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Um, 
A move. move. The question is amendment 122B be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three in favour, six against. Amendment 122B is not agreed. To call Amendment 122C in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 121. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. Um, the question is Amendment 122C be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three in favour and six against. Amendment 122C is not agreed. Call Amendment 122D in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 121. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. Uh, the question is that Amendment 122D be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against. Three in favour, six against. Amendment 122D is not agreed. Cabinet Secretary to Bressler withdraw Amendment 122 as... Um, yeah. Moved. 122. Moved. Moved. Mm -hmm. The question is that uh, Amendment 122 be agreed. Yes. Yes, we are all agreed. Um, call Amendment 123 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 121. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 123 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 64 in the name of Daniel Johnson, grouped with Amendment 65, 66, 67 and 129. Daniel Johnson to move Amendment 64 and speak to all amendments in the group. Well, thank you very much, Convener. And can I reassure the Cabinet Secretary, we are very much uh, on progressive and cuddly ground with this next set of amendments. And I, can I also say at the outset that these are largely, uh, well, these are probing amendments um, that, that while I move, I will not press because I, I do recognise that there's considerable technical uh, difficulty with each of them. However, I think what I am seeking to do is raise, I think, a fundamental issue and one that I think really it, 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 this bill could have and should have addressed more fully. And that the Management of Offenders Bill, as I understand it, is seeking to make provision to improve um, the, 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 the process at the end of the, the time that someone spends in prison. And that's a very important time. It's one where, where I think fundamentally the, the criminal justice system will fail or succeed because it's at that point that someone is released from prison that they, they, they will successfully reintegrate in society or they won't. What these provisions seek to do is make some simple steps or set out some simple ways forward that we can drastically improve people's ability to do just that because at the moment what very often happens is that people are left uh, to uh, their own devices, released from prison with £50 in their pocket, with nowhere to go, no means of sustaining themselves and no access to health care. And quite simply, I would ask this question, what on earth do we expect to happen when we release people in those circumstances and those conditions? Because the reality is, is that for a great number of people faced with those circumstances, they will have no option but to re-offend, either because that's the only means that they have of sustaining themselves, or simply because those circumstances will mean that they will be immediately re-immersed within the, the social circumstances and material circumstances that led to the offending behaviour that put them in prison in the first place. So that's what these amendments seek to do. And in particular, 64 sets out the broad duties of providing access to GP and address um, identity um, in, in the broad terms, and then each of the amendments 65, 66 and 67 spells those out in a bit more detail. And in particular, 65 was informed by, and can I at this point just thank the WISE group for um, uh, making it possible for me to shadow one of their uh, prison mentors. And we literally spent the day going back and forth across Glasgow to help an individual get the medication they needed to stay clean, to stay off illegal drugs. Because if we hadn't done that, uh, they would have returned to their street dealer and, and uh, a life of uh, illegal uh, drug consumption. And the reason that they, we had to do that on that day 
was because they didn't have, uh, they weren't registered with the GP because they lost their registration with the GP when they entered prison. So the, the simple point of Amendment 65 is to make a, a legal obligation to provide registration with a GP um, at the point that someone releases. I think this is simply a, 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 much a, a matter of bureaucracy, that many of these people will have been registered with the GP before they entered prison. So why can't they simply re-register with the GP before? And indeed, they receive medical care when they're in prison. And, 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 and from general practitioners. So likewise, those provisions, could they not be extended, albeit on a temporary basis, for people after release? Uh, if Liam Carr would like to come in, I'll take the intervention. Very grateful, Daniel Johnson. Um, it's just a very brief one. As Daniel Johnson knows, I'm very sympathetic to, to what he's trying to achieve here. Um, my concern is around the practicalities uh, of mandating the registration with a, a, a GP. I mean, certainly... In, in the northeast of Scotland, uh, that is a challenge uh, at the moment. And so I just wonder if uh, he can speak about the practicalities of if it is simply not possible uh, for the government to achieve this it, were it to be brought in, what would happen then? Well, I mean, I'd just uh, like to thank the member for that point and indeed it raises a much wider point around access to GPs and the number of closed uh, lists that there are across Scotland, certainly in my constituency, that, that proportion is around 60 to 70 per cent of GP practices are closed to new patients. But that notwithstanding, the reality is, is that those people receive medical care while they're in prison. And I do wonder whether or not there, are, there is the possibility and the flexibility to provide some sort of medical general practitioner access uh, following prison. But that notwithstanding, the reality is, in terms of those practicalities, is that not providing them with a, a registered GP will lead to circumstances which will cause reoffending. And so, yes, it is challenging, but failure to do this will be to let that individual down. But more importantly, I think, will we'll, we'll, uh, create circumstances that that individual may well reoffend. Amendment 66 is around providing an address. Now, while I would uh, like to see a much broader stated uh, requirement to uh, assure uh, 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 ensure that there is some form of accommodation is available for the individual when they're released from prison. I recognise that is a, uh, is a huge ask. However, I think providing a correspondence address, so at least that individual has the ability to um, uh, 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 make all means of provision for themselves in terms of opening bank accounts um, or, or indeed uh, other such um, uh, measures, I think would be a major step forward. Indeed, I know in Ireland, the postal service there has a recently announced uh, plans to create free personal postal addresses to enable letter collection and also provide a, a formal address for people without uh, permanent accommodation. And it strikes me that such a scheme could work in these circumstances. Um, similarly, uh, on Amendment 67 is around um, uh, being able to prove identity. And I, I will just explain some of the detail of this in particular. Uh, lacking uh, proof of identity is a major hurdle for people coming out of prison, both in terms of applying for jobs, applying for other things they need to lead their lives, but most importantly in terms of applying for benefits. The DWP simply will not take applications unless people can prove their identity, and that has to be photographic ID, which brings me on to why it specifies a driver's licence. And on that note, can I just reassure members that can also include a provisional driver's licence. You do not need to have passed your test. But that is simply because that is the only form of, of ID, that or a passport, that the DWP will accept. They will not take the other, uh, the, there are a number of uh, proof of identity schemes out there, but they are not acceptable to the DWP as I understand it, which is why either a passport or driver's licence is required and why for the purposes of this amendment, I have specified a driver's licence. And finally, um, and coming to, absolutely. Just, I mean, again, Daniel Johnson knows my concern on that. The, um, I, I completely understand the reason for the amendment, uh, and I think it's a good one. I completely understand his rationale behind mandating a, a full or provisional driving licence, and I understand where he's getting that from. Uh, I'm not convinced it is the right solution, uh, because whilst uh, the application for a provisional driving licence, people apply for this for particular reasons, to be able to drive. Uh, and I'm not convinced that we should be using that as a circuitous route to apply for benefits. It, it rather suggests to me that, uh, and I, I very much hesitate to go into matters that are presumably reserved and we don't want to go there, uh, 
but why would we be uh, why wouldn't we be addressing the requirements of the DWP uh, and saying look perhaps there are a wider suite of documents that are more appropriate rather than trying to drive people towards a provisional license uh, which is not what it was created for I mean, I'd simply answer the member this, and I, I understand, and I had reservations before putting this detail in. Uh, however, in the absence of any other form of official photographic ID that's acceptable, this is really the only means uh, to take forward. I mean, the only other option would be uh, providing, uh, 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 making provision for passport applications. And I think, for very obvious reasons, um, making it more feasible for people to uh, go abroad when they may well be being released on licence may not be what we want to uh, promote um, through this bill. Finally, I'd just like to come to Amendment 129. The best way we can prevent someone from reoffending is to ensure that they have a job. I think that is intuitively correct, and it's also, I think, what the evidence shows us. And what this amendment seeks to do is that the, 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 the prison service takes all steps uh, uh, within its power to ensure that someone has employment, and short of that, that they make possible that that person is able to apply for benefits in advance of leaving prison. We are all too familiar with the issues regarding applications for universal credit and the time lag that, that is uh, uh, innate within that process. What this amendment simply seeks to do, that we, uh, while the, before that person is released, that we make provision for them making the necessary applications, either for employment or for benefits, to ensure that when they are released, it is not just £50 that they have in their pocket, but they actually have the means of supporting themselves and therefore uh, removing the issues that they have that can lead to reoffending after they are released. And indeed, this reflects very much some of the good practice that already takes place in some parts of the prison service, and notably in HMP in Venice, where there is a scheme such as this in place. What this uh, uh, amendment seeks to do is simply make that a legal obligation and a legal duty um, so that all prisoners can enjoy this. But fundamentally, um, the, the point of these amendments is this. The best way we have of keeping our community safe, of preventing offending, uh, is to make sure that those who have come out of prison uh, have given the best opportunities to rehabilitate and reoffend, so that they, they, they do not reoffend in the future. Rather, that is the best way we can keep our community safe, and that's what these amendments seek to do. Um, and I'm happy to move these amendments in my name. John Finney. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for Daniel Johnson bringing them forward and what's not to like about them. Preparing the preparation for release is crucial and we've heard this repeatedly over the years from the prison service. Of course, this strays into the aftercare and it's equally important. And if you don't have the, <coughs> excuse me, the fundamental principles of a, a roof over your head and access to medical treatment, particularly given some of the challenging conditions that uh, people in prisons have, then, then you, you have a problem. The irony is, of course, that it's in relatively recent times that medical provision transferred from the Scottish Prison Service to the NHS anyway. So that, ironically, should make these things easier. But as the member rightly identifies the challenges around um, closed lists for, for practices, um, and medical practices, a way around that, of course, is an increase in the use of salaried doctors, as we saw with salaried dentists, and I would commend that. Um, in preparing for uh, today's um, meeting, I, I certainly had a yes against 64, 65 and 66. I think there are challenges and Unlike Mr Kerr, I'm very happy to go into reserved issues and say best of luck trying to get changes quickly with DWP because when they visited the grief of universal credit on, uh, uh, in the Inverness area, I have to say that the damage that's been caused is, 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 still, is still being felt. Um, so um, I, I'm very interested to hear what uh, the Cabinet Secretary has to say, but certainly minded to support the 64, 65 and 66. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Yes. Um, to say that I, you know, totally agree with uh, Daniel Johnson on the points he's raised, and, and um, you know, I thank him for raising this, this really, really, these really important points. However, it's the practicalities. I agree with um, Liam Kerr on this one. Um, it's the practicalities of it and the wider consequences that, that concern me. And that would be, you know, if these conditions couldn't be met, would the prisoner have, have to remain in prison and for how long? Um, it also has huge financial implications, um, which I don't think is really addressed um, in, in your amendment. And I think all these, issue, all these issues should be and, and, and could be raised out with the rule and they must be considered because I totally agree with everything you've said. I just don't think that this amendment is a place for it. Uh, Lee MacArthur. 
Hey, thank you very much. Can I again start by um, thanking Daniel Johnson for bringing forward um, uh, amendments that absolutely speak to the heart of the importance, not just of aftercare, but of three, through care, the way that it integrates with what goes on in the, uh, in the prison estate as well. I think not only has he identified um, uh, instances where this has got right, maybe not in, in its entirety, but in, in large part, um, which begs the question, why is that not consistent across uh, the board? He's also identified areas where I think drawn on experience for, from elsewhere, there are improvements that I think could yet uh, be made. I would question whether putting that on the on the face of this bill is um, is appropriate, but um, nevertheless, I, I think what it has done is uh, serve to, uh, to, to to illustrate where we're we're falling short. And in terms of of, of reducing rates of reoffending, I think he's absolutely right. Um, this is not just about the well being and the welfare of the individuals; it's about the uh, it's about the, uh, the, the the safety and the well being of communities as a, as a whole. And they are ill served by by pretending that simply um, releasing prisoners back into the community with none of the supports um, outlined in his amendments is, is, is a recipe for success. Um, so I, I, I thank him for bringing these amendments forward. I, I got the impression from um, uh, his early comments in, in moving the amendments that he wasn't necessarily expecting to, to, to press them, but um, perhaps it gives an opportunity ahead of, of stage three to see if there are ways of, of, of using um, the, the issues uh, highlighted in, in those amendments to, to um, strengthen the bill at stage three. Uh, Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. And I, I want to uh, put on record my uh, thanks to Daniel Johnson as well, and I've got a lot of sympathy with the uh, uh, amendments that he has brought forward. I recognise that he said that they're mainly probing in nature, and perhaps the, uh, the, the goal was to, to bring out a discussion, which he's certainly done. I, I do believe, though, that most of the things he's talked about are more of an operational uh, matter, a bit like what Ronan Mackay was saying. My own experience working in the criminal justice system, there's some really good uh, you know, examples of um, people being prepared for release, and there's, there, there's some really bad examples. But I think we need to maybe look at it in terms of the multi-agency arrangements that are in place and learn from good practice, perhaps. The Inverness uh, one is one that could be that could be looked at. So, uh, you know, I do I do think that these are more operational in nature rather than on the face of the bill. Um, but I appreciate that there were more problem amendments. The only one I wasn't totally uh, clear on, or, or um, didn't really have a view on, was the, the need to have a driving licence or a or a passport. It was brought up. I think that I, I'm, I have to say I'm not too sure on that one. But in general, the principles of the, most of the amendments are yeah, something that I think we need to get right through the operational. Um, I too just can I thank Daniel Johnson for introducing these um, amendments. He said they were taken and take, you know, he didn't intend to, to move them, but in tabling them he's allowed a crucial discussion on these really important issues where services should be and the support should be available to, to prisoners on release from prison, but all too often simply aren't there. And here, you know, Daniel Johnson mentioned the Wise Group, they step up to the plate for the offenders they support and very often help and um, stop what may be quite easily um, reoffending uh, re because these services and benefits, etc., just aren't in, in place. Um, but not everyone is, is fortunate enough to be supported by the WISE group. So I, I very much look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary has to say, because it seems to me if home detention curfew is to work properly, then the resources and the support must be in there to, to quote the WISE group, not set up these um, prisoners for failure when they're released from prison. Thank you, <coughs> convener. Can I thank uh, Daniel Johnson for his uh, amendments? Uh, also for his uh, articulation of, of those amendments and the context within which he has brought them forward. Um, I appreciate the fact that these are probing uh, amendments. I think they're important to bring forward, even though he isn't looking to, to, to press them necessarily, <coughs> because the discussion we've had around this table uh, in itself has been very fruitful, and there seems to be little in the way of disagreement. That more can and should be done in terms of uh, through care support uh, for prisoners uh, leaving uh, our prison estate. Um, I won't go into all the detail because I know they are probing amendments, all the reasons why I think practically these amendments would, wouldn't quite work, but I will just touch upon um, a few points uh, if I can. Before I do that, um, can I say that 
if, he, if he's not to press his amendments, um, we should be working closely with members around some of the non-legislative options we can bring forward to try to realise some, in effect, what, what, what Daniel Johnson is trying to do. Um, in terms of um, Amendment um, 64, um, again, some of these, these issues um, have been discussed around the table. Um, uh, what I would say, uh, around 64, 65, 66, 67. Um, the issues around the GP, uh, Liam Kerr touched upon, upon, upon some of these issues, um, but just to give some reassurance, the current guidelines and guidance is such um, that, that patient registration processes are meant to be fair for all patients, uh, including those that are leaving prison. Um, it confirms that a GP practice cannot refuse registration if the patient cannot provide proof of ID or address. I accept, though, what Daniel Johnson is saying. Especially if it's informed by the wise group, who you know I hold in, in, in the highest esteem, that, that, that even though that may be what's on, on paper, if that is not what's happening in practice, then we have to work closely to, to, to address some of that. What I cannot do, and I think Liam Kerr touched upon this, what I cannot do, as our ministers cannot do, is compel an individual to register with a GP. Um, the amendment would then prevent an individual's timely release if they themselves chose not to register with the GP, and that obviously would be an unacceptable uh, situation. There's also issues about changes around the registration um, would, would, would maybe entail uh, changes to the national GP contract. And uh, again, I'm not persuaded that's a proportionate response, but notwithstanding that, there's more we can do around the health, uh, absolutely, and well-being of those leaving the prison estate. In terms of the, the, the Amendment 66, uh, which was around the correspondence um, address, um, th there's a lot of work going on in around um, the shore standards, sustainable housing <coughs> on release for everyone. Standards I've met with Kevin Stewart <coughs> on, on, on a number of occasions to discuss this uh, in, in greater uh, detail as well. Um, uh, again, perhaps I can provide the member with some written detail on how we're taking forward some of the issues in around um, housing. If the aim of the amendment is to provide a postal address to allow an individual to engage with key services, common practice um, allows an individual to use the address of a friend or relative uh, or the address of a service provider, such as, as I say, a GP or a job centre. But he did give reference to uh, a scheme in Ireland, I think, that he mentioned. I don't have detail of that, but if he was able to pass that on, I think we should explore all ideas, all avenues, um, possibly. Um, in terms of Amendment 67, um, the, the, the valid identification uh, document, in this case a driving licence, um, the SPS is currently reviewing the provision of ID for all individuals leaving their care. Um, they have an identification, identification process in place, um, including the provision of a standard photographic letter for individuals supported by through care support officers without a form of ID. Um, I should say, um, despite his, his, his suggestions, my understanding is that that letter uh, is accepted by the Department of Work and Pensions, as well as banks, GP registration and housing organisations as an appropriate form of ID. If he or the WISE group and anybody else have uh, lived experience of that not being the case, then I, I would want to, to, to hear about that. Um, just the two objections in terms of reading a driving licence, the cost uh, likely to be prohibitive for most prisoners, um, and um, also, of course, the other point may be that the individual may be disqualified from holding a driving licence as part of the offence that was committed and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> in terms of Amendment 129, um, that imposes uh, a duty on the ministers to ensure uh, that a prisoner has suitable means of financial uh, support. Um, while I support, again, the intent, that there are probably practical and legal implications. It may be that, that a person uh, does not want to apply for work or seek social security assistance. Um, I don't, again, accept that would be in, in, in a minority of cases, but it provides no flexibility to manage a situation where a person declines consent to apply, in which case the prisoner could not be released and that would be in breach of uh, ECHR, uh, of course. Uh, notwithstanding all of that, we, we offer a safety net in the form of the Scottish Welfare Fund. Any individual leaving prison may make an application for a crisis uh, grant to meet the immediate short-term financial needs. But I think what Daniel Johnson is talking about is not just about those short-term crisis interventions, but actually a long-term, sustainable, holistic support that will prevent the person from reoffending once again. And in that, then he has no objections for me to see how we can uh, better that regime. But I think the, 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 the way to do that would be non-legislative as opposed to legislative. So I'd ask him not to press his amendment.
Okay. Daniel Johnson to wind up press or withdraw. Uh, can I just thank all members and indeed the, the Cabinet Secretary also for, for the constructive comments that they have made. The, the point of these amendments, I think, is uh, to establish, I think, core principles. I think that it is vital that we ensure that, that people who are leaving prison have access to health care, um, access to an address, and access to a means of supporting themselves. That is the best way of, of preventing reoffending. I, I would be interested in exploring ways of taking some of these ideas forward at stage three, but likewise, I, 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 you know, the, this is not the last time that I will uh, be raising these issues or bringing forward similar amendments. I, I think that there are hopefully uh, will be opportunities in the future because I think fundamentally on well, except what members are saying about um, a, a number of these issues being uh, practical or, or indeed operational. That being said, I think there is also something in making sure that there is a, a legal duty, so that there is a legal requirement uh, and, a, and, a, and a clearly understood uh, benchmark uh, that, that um, is obtained for everyone. Um, I think that is also important, which is why I think some of these things maybe do need to be enshrined in law, perhaps not today, um, but hopefully in, at a, a future uh, occasion. So with that in mind, um, I will be um, withdrawing and not pressing uh, these amendments at that, this time. Okay. Amendment 64, not moved. Call Amendment 65 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 64. Daniel Johnson, to move or not move? Not move. Amendment 65, not moved. Call Amendment 66 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 64. Daniel Johnson, to move or not move? Not move. Amendment 66, not moved. Call Amendment 67 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 64. Daniel Johnson, to move or not move? Not move. Amendment 67, not moved. Call Amendment 129 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 64. Daniel Johnson, to move or not move? Not move. Han amendment 129 not moved. Um, the question is that section 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed? Call amendment 124 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with amendment 111. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. The question is that section 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Called Amendment 125 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 111. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is Amendment 125 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Um, call Amendment 126 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 111. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Question is that section 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. Question is that section 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Yeah. Um, I, I'm aware of the time, however, um, I do intend to start um, discussion of the next group. The next group is um, is an important one and I'm going to allow us to debate this and put the relevant question and then I'll end consideration of the bill um, after that. So call it, um, Amendment 71 in the name of Neil Bibby, grouped with Amendment 71A and 72, Neil Bibby to move Amendment 71 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener, and uh, good afternoon to the committee and to the minister. Um, <clears throat> I wish to speak to the amendment in my name, which would require an inquiry to take place under Section 2 of the Inquiries and Sudden Deaths Act 2016, where a death is caused by a person subject to a curfew condition such as a home detention curfew. The committee is well aware of the tragic murder of Craig McClelland, a young father killed just minutes away from his Paisley home in a violent and unprovoked knife attack. The man convicted of Craig's murder was unlawfully at large when the attack took place and he had been unlawfully at large for over five months, having broken an electronic tag and violated the terms of his home detention curfew. As the committee know, the then Justice Secretary Michael Matheson subsequently asked both HMIPS and HMICS to conduct reviews into the HDC regime. These reviews were described as process reviews by the government and were not specifically tasked with looking at what went wrong in this particular case. Recommendations were made, some of which will be acted on today, and that is welcome. And it was established that there were significant failings leading up to the murder. However, there has not been a specific inquiry into why this was allowed to happen and whether it could have been prevented. 
The shortcoming of the reviews were clearly demonstrated when the family detailed over 30 key questions that were not answered in these reviews. A fatal accident inquiry commonplace for deaths on the prison estate is not automatic in cases like this. There are a whole range of circumstances in which a fatal accident inquiry would be mandatory, but that does not include cases where a prisoner on a home detention curfew commits a murder. It does not even include cases where a prisoner who has violated a home detention uh, curfew uh, commits a murder. The Lord Advocate could use his discretionary powers to instruct that an FAI takes place, but is not under no obligation to do so. The Justice Secretary could have instructed an independent public inquiry, but he said he is not persuaded by the case. The Minister has met with Craig's family, but he has been unable to provide them with the answers they need or fully explain why the system failed Craig. I do not believe the government's response to this strategy has been adequate, and that is why I have had to bring forward this amendment. The family need answers, they deserve answers, but they should not have to plead for answers. What happened to Craig McClelland was a tragic failure of the system, a disgrace that has horrified and appalled my community. That failure must be independently investigated, explained and exposed. There must be a full inquiry into the McClelland case and into all cases of this kind whenever they occur not at the discretion of ministers or the Lord Advocate, but as a matter of course. My amendment would ensure that where a death is caused by a person subject to a curfew condition, that an inquiry is held under Section 2 of the Inquiries into Fatal Accident and Sudden Deaths Acts 2016. This would apply where deaths occur on or after the 15th of January 2016, and so includes the McClellan case. An inquiry held under the 2016 Act is presided over independently by a sheriff and seeks to both establish the circumstances of a death and consider what steps, if any, might be taken to prevent other deaths in similar circumstances. It considers whether reasonable steps could have been taken to avoid the death and whether there are any defects in a system of working which could have contributed to the death in the first place. This is therefore a type of inquiry the family can have confidence in and an inquiry that would serve the public interest too. And let's be clear, ensuring that there's an inquiry into the McClellan case is absolutely in the public interest. Over 5,000 people have signed a petition demanding that inquiry takes place and that an inquiry is automatic wherever a prisoner on HDC commits a murder. Convener, much of the committee's scrutiny of this bill has centred on the home detention curfew and in the wake of Craig McClellan's murder, you have quite rightly had to consider how to restore confidence in the system. I believe that the only way to restore confidence in the system is to ensure that a family like Craig's can have confidence in that system. Right now, they do not. The system has tragically failed them. It failed Craig McClelland and it failed his three children growing up now without their father. I'm asking the committee to consider my amendment to ensure that the lessons of this tragedy and any future tragedies are fully learned. Thank you. Okay. Liam Kerr to move amendment 71A and speak to all amendments in the group. Yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, I'll be brief. I move 71A in my name. I, and first of all, it's because I completely associate myself with the comments that Mr. Bibby's made this morning. I think that was a, a very persuasive uh, and important uh, discussion that, that he's brought forward, and I'm grateful to him for that. Uh, I think he's right to bring the amendment forward. Uh, because I think it's right in the, the particular circumstance that Mr Bibby details that Craig McClellan's family and indeed those involved in similar situations get the answers that they have been denied and uh, I think Mr Bibby made an important point when he said they shouldn't have to plead. Uh, I strongly agree with that sentiment. Uh, the reason for my further amendment 71A is simply because uh, Mr. Bibby points out that, uh, or he seeks to ensure that there's an automatic inquiry when uh, a person on HDC commits a murder. I simply wish to expand the scope of that amendment to cover all prisoners released from prison on licence. Uh, I am of the view that there should be a robust inquiry into every death caused by someone who is released early from prison. Uh, not least so that the authorities responsible for the release have to be answerable for what has taken place. So uh, on that note, I'll uh, seek the committee's views, but I certainly move 71A in my name. Uh, John Finney and Liam MacArthur. Yeah, um, <coughs> excuse me, Commissioner. Yes, 
I'm very grateful to both the members bringing this forward. And, uh, you know, as someone who values every single human life, then, um, you know, there are a number of tragedies. And uh, it would be very easy here to say, to sit here and say, yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I just happen to think it's not a good idea. Um, as a matter of course, is a phrase that Mr. Bavier said require, he said in relation to deaths in prisons that was commonplace. Um, much as, and I don't, don't know if Mr. Bibby was in previously when we were discussing about um, judicial discretion, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm very loath to never say never. Um, I, I, I think if we take, for instance, moving on to Mr. Kerr's comments about deaths and a robust inquiry. Well, of course, every death is subject to a robust inquiry. It may well be that individual family members aren't content with the outcome of that, but at the direction of the Lord Advocate, Police Scotland undertake inquiries. I'm trying to think of the unintended consequences where this to, to proceed, and, and it could well be that you have a, a situation where a family have had the, the uh, trauma of going through a, a murder trial, have participated in that, <coughs> excuse me, then have this waiting. What's the chronology of that? What is the long-term effects? Um, I, w this committee over the years has, has discussed fatal accident inquiries on a number of occasions. I've actually sat through a fatal accident inquiry. I have to say, um, there's a lot of disgruntled people <coughs> quite often with a fatal accident inquiry. The quest is to understand the background to, it, to a death. And it is, in, excuse me, in the public interest. And just as we talk about prosecution sometimes being in the public interest, then you're going to have complainers, because that's what they are at that point without a trial, uh, dissatisfied. So as I say, I think it would be very easy just to put my head down here and vote, but I, I think we must think about any unintended consequences. I think there will be occasions where it's absolutely appropriate to have a fatal accident inquiry into deaths, and there's other circumstances where, on the individual circumstances for that case, that's inappropriate. So, unfortunately, I won't be supporting either of these amendments. Liam MacArthur, <coughs> Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Like uh, John Finney, can I thank Neil Bibby for bringing forward uh, the amendment? Um, I think he was in earlier on for the discussion around the amendments. Uh, in relation to unlawfully at large, uh, that, has, uh, that has strengthened the, the bill and addressed some of the, the, the concerns arising out of the, uh, the, the tragic murder of uh, Mr McClelland. Um, I think in relation to the, uh, the proposals being brought forward in, in uh, this amendment, I, I am supportive of them. I'm certainly conscious of the, the concerns raised by, by John Finney and, and, and not... Um, not deaf to them. Um, I, I think, however, we've a situation at the moment where our um, uh, fatal accident inquiry system is not functioning as uh, we would uh, like or we would expect, and I think that is damaging public confidence in it. Uh, Mr Bibby referred to um, the feeling that the McClellan family have that they are some, somehow pleading uh, for an FAI inquiry. I think if, if those inquiries were being um, decisions around those inquiries being held in a, in a timely fashion. I don't think the McClellan family would uh, would be forced to feel that way. I think I, we can all draw on a number of examples of where uh, fatal accident inquiries um, uh, are long, long, long overdue. Uh, people waiting um, sometimes up to uh, a decade uh, for uh, a, a, a fatal accident inquiry um, to be held. It is difficult to, to, <coughs> to uh, understand how it is that lessons can truly be learnt uh, when those sorts of delays uh, are inbuilt into the system. So if, in the event that um, this uh, Mr Bibby's amendment is not successful uh, this afternoon, and, and I suspect that, uh, that it won't be, I very much hope that what it will do is drive forward the, uh, the, the process of improving the system of, of FAIs, which at the moment I would have to say is, uh, is broken. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Convener. Can I also thank my colleague uh, Neil Bibby for, I think, setting out very well, I think, the the need to have this uh, amendment, but more in particular, I was just wondering if I could address my comments to what John and Finney are saying. And I, and I, and I, I, I agree with John Finney on a, on a great deal, and and I, and I hear what he has to say. I think we do have to be very careful about unintended consequences. I think there can sometimes be a tendency to want to have you know every decision subject to inquiry and process, and that that isn't always helpful. However, the other thing that we must always be mindful of when we are looking at legislation and amendments in particular is looking for anomalies um, and, where, and inconsistencies. And I believe that this actually addresses an anomaly and an inconsistency. Throughout the consideration of this bill, I, I've stressed time and time again, I think 
the importance that we recognise that people who are released on licence, who are released on HDC, are out in, in, in the general public in lieu of being in prison. They're still serving their, their prison sentences. More importantly, as it stands at the moment, there is an automatic FAI for when deaths occur when they're in prison. So therefore we have the circumstances where someone is serving a prison sentence, but because they are serving it in the community, out on tag, under licence, that, uh, uh, that, that, that there isn't an FAI when they then uh, and, uh, uh, you know, commit a murder, because that's essentially what we're looking at here, when, when, when there is a death caused by someone out on NHDC. We, we have a situation where we have an anomaly where if that, that death had occurred inside prison while they're serving sentence, that there would be an FAI. And the other particular point is that if you, you to, 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 to boil it down to those very crude, raw factors, we're, we're dealing with, I think, what is a, a major system failure where someone has been released, is subject to a great deal of monitoring, who is serving a prison sentence and yet causes another individual's death. I think those are circumstances such that there is dramatic, severe uh, and critical systems failure that does require investigation and does warrant an FAI. So I think this closes that anomaly and ensures that that will always happen in these circumstances going forward, and I think that's important. Uh, I too think um, Neil Baby has made a, a very powerful case um, in support of his amendment, citing um, Craig um, McClellan's murder, where no inquiry was held, uh, was held despite the, the family's pleas for this. Um, I therefore fully support Amendment 71, which provides for the automatic, for an automatic fatal accident inquiry where the death is caused by a person on curfew. And it seems to me, therefore, too, that it makes sense that Amendment 71A, which expands this provision to deaths um, caused where people are on licence, um, should be supported also. Cabinet Secretary. Also, <coughs> Um, thank you, Convener. Um, and I also want to, to put on record um, <coughs> thanks to Neil Bibby um, for bringing this uh, forward and for advocating and articulating so well on behalf of his constituents um, here in, in the committee. Um, I, I think that it's, you know, I think that all of us as uh, MSPs and members in this committee um, feel um, the weight of responsibility um, that's came out of the tragic. Um, incident with Craig McQuill, and I know that the Cabinet Secretary feels it as well. And um, I think it's only, it can only be some very small comfort for the family that, um, that, that, is, that the situation has had a major impact on this particular piece of legislation uh, throughout it, from its delay and various other aspects. And I know that that can only be a small comfort, but hopefully a lot of good will come out in the future. In relation to this particular amendment, I agree with the sentiments expressed by, by John Finney. I don't think that there's enough evidence at this stage uh, for an automatic FAI. Um, but I will be interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary is going to say. And if there's something that can be brought forward, that CGD, I was just finishing. But, yeah. Just very briefly, um, I'm listening very carefully, Mr McGregor. You say there's not enough evidence at this stage. What evidence would you need to change that conclusion? Well, I, I think that in terms of the evidence of what the unintended consequences might be, I think that perhaps the, 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 the case that we've talked about in this particular situation may have warranted a, a, an FAI if the Lord Advocate had decided to do that. But I think that every situation, as we've said about uh, other parts of this bill today, would need to be uh, looked at in unique circumstances. But as I also finish by saying, I'm interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary is saying, not just for today, but in, in also going forward to stage three. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Convener. I can express the sentiments of those uh, around the table who have already spoken. And all of us are, are united in our um, thoughts and, and, and sympathies very much with the family uh, of, of, of Craig McLeod. I mentioned that in, in my previous uh, amendment uh, that was that was moved, but I want to reiterate it um, once again. Can I also thank Neil Bibby and Liam Kerr for coming forward with the amendments, Neil Bibby. Uh, and I have had exchanges. Um, sometimes they have been uh, difficult exchanges, and and and, uh, and, and I do sometimes uh, regret the, that that it has been difficult. But nonetheless, um, I don't doubt for a minute that Neil Bibby has brought these amendments forward because he is advocating on behalf uh, of those that he seeks to to, to, to represent. And um, uh, I, 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 I again just put that on note and put that on record. From my, my perspective and the Scottish Government's perspective, um, we will be resisting 
uh, the amendments, and I'll try to articulate the reasons why. The category of mandatory FAIs was considered and legislated for in the context of the 2016 Act. Uh, that passed Parliament with unanimous support. Uh, I accept that in itself is not a uh, reason to, to have a look at FAI, uh, FAI arrangements afresh in the future, but we should be mindful that the 2016 Act is a recent enactment that followed careful review by Lord Cullen and lengthy consultation and lengthy parliamentary consideration. The end result was a spe specif uh, that, that, that specified a mandatory FAI in the narrow circumstances of a death in custody and deaths in the course of a person's employment. Uh, we need to take great care before disturbing the conclusions, uh, I think, of that most recent legislation. So the secondary point I'd like to make is one that has already been touched upon um, by, by a couple of members, uh, John Finney in, in, in particular. Uh, when I was considering these amendments, I, I, I of course, uh, as you would imagine, had exchanges uh, also and in conversation with the Lord Advocate. FEIs are the remit of the Lord Advocate. And uh, he was happy for me to say that he has also expressed his concerns um, to me. He feels that um, the, these amendments would fetter the independent Lord Advocate's discretion uh, and, for example, may result in a requirement to hold an FEI, even if the circumstances are uncontroversial and, un un and uncomplicated. But crucially, this perhaps goes to, to Liam Kerr's question and Fulton McGregor's answer, in a case where bereaved relatives do not even want one, and that sometimes already happens with some deaths um, in custody. Where the circumstances justify it, the Crown will undertake a death investigation and may, in addition to any criminal proceedings, investigate any other matters which bear on the circumstances of the death, and indeed instruct a discretionary FAI. The Crown will always engage with the families of victims in regards, both in the context of the criminal proceedings and under the family liaison chart in relation to any wider death investigation. There are accordingly mechanisms whereby in appropriate cases an investigation will be undertaken in such cases, and indeed in the specified case, the McClellan case, which we mentioned, um, the, the, the Crown will do this. If the FAI is justified, in addition to any criminal proceedings, an FAI can be held there's no need for a statutory provision to that effect. The ordinary course in the 2016 Act is that even in the cases of mandatory FAIs, a uh, Lord Advocate may determine that circumstances have been adequately established in related criminal proceedings um, and determine on that ground that an FAI would not be justified. There's no equivalent qualification in the proposed amendments, but it may be quite likely that there would be related criminal proceedings. Finally, there's two points just on drafting. Um, firstly, the term, and I quote, have caused the death is a broad phrase which would cover death by homicide, death by careless driving or dangerous driving, and indeed circumstances which are wholly accidental and do not give rise to any suspicion of criminality. And secondly, in terms of drafting, um, it is, as, as members know, most unusual to make retrospective provisions in any legislation and a specific policy justification would be required um, given the existing powers to order a discretionary FAI, I'm not convinced that retrospective application of this provision uh, is necessarily justified. So, for the reasons I provided, I'd ask that the members uh, do not oppress uh, their, their, their amendments. And, of course, uh, if they do, uh, then I would urge the committee to reject them. Neil Bowie, to wind up. Thank you, convener. I thank the committee for their contributions. As I explained earlier, inquiries under the 2016 Act are an established procedure presided over independently by a sheriff for ascertaining both the circumstances of a death and whether any, anything could have been done to prevent that death. An inquiry is mandated by the 2016 Act where a death occurs in lawful custody or whilst the deceased was at work. Therefore, FAIs into death on the prison estate are a common. If a prisoner were to die, I'll repeat again, if a prisoner were to die or if a prisoner were to kill another, then an inquiry would be mandated under the 2016 Act. Yet where a prisoner commits a murder in the community, while subject to a home detention curfew, inquiries under the Act is not mandatory. That leaves families like the family of Craig McClelland in the horrendous position of having to plead for answers about what happened and why. A fatal accident inquiry into the circumstances lead leading to the murder of Craig McClelland is demonstrably in the public interest. I hear some members and the Minister may not be persuaded by the case, but the family of Craig McClelland are, and the public are on their side. Over 5,000 People have signed a petition in support of an inquiry and this amendment. It's not an onerous amendment. The only case I'm aware of since 2016 that will be covered by the amendment is the death of Craig McClelland. However, my amendment would also ensure that any future death in these circumstances is subject to an inquiry too, not at the discretion of ministers or the Lord Advocate, but as a matter of course and as a matter of principle. I've heard the comments from uh, the committee 
um, and the Cabinet Secretary, and I, I note the points uh, that they make. I would say that the Lord Advocate would, in unique circumstances, have exemption, but generally they are describing legislation as mandatory where there is a death in custody. Fatal accident inquiries, therefore, should be mandatory in these cases, similar to deaths in custody. But I, you know, on the question of whether this is necessary, I do believe this is necessary because this is a tragic case and it's actually a case study in why this amendment is necessary. This amendment is necessary because there hasn't been a public inquiry. This amendment is necessary because there hasn't been a fatal accident uh, inquiry. It's clear from what members um, have said that there isn't a majority on the committee at this time um, for these amendments to guarantee an inquiry into the McClellan case. My own view has not changed. It is as strong as ever. An inquiry is essential and a change in the law is required to mandate that inquiry as things stand. However, in light of the contributions to, in today's debate, I will not impress uh, the amendments in my name today. Instead, I will reflect on the comments made. I will um, uh, look at the, the issues that have been uh, raised about drafting and some of the concerns that have been raised by uh, John Finney and others. And I will seek to reintroduce the amendment at stage three to guarantee that this, debate, uh, this, this amendment is debated further. At that stage, all members of Parliament, including those who represent the McClellan family, uh, will have the opportunity to decide whether they are prepared to vote to secure an inquiry or not. Thank you. Liam Kerr to wind up on, uh, on Amendment 71A, press of withdrawal. Uh, I don't have a great deal to add to, uh, again, Neil Bowie's very coherent and uh, important summing up there. I, I think a couple of points that came out, I, I do understand Daniel Johnson's point and Neil Bibby about the anomaly in, in as much as there appears to be a mandatory FAI for deaths in custody, uh, yet not uh, outside uh, outside of custody, and it, it does feel odd, uh, to say the least. Um, and on, I, I understand John Finney's point about the the family might not, and indeed the cabinet secretary made a similar point about the family might not be in a place where they actually, uh, in a, in a particular situation, want this to go forward. My, my counter to that is a question: Isn't it always? Is uh, Daniel Johnson seemed to be saying that something has gone? or potentially has gone massively wrong, uh, surely we have to understand uh, fully what that is. And, and this would be one mechanism to do it. So I, I understand the point being made, uh, but a failure of such significance needs in investigation. Yes, of course. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention in that point. For the avoidance of doubt, I'm not saying that it would not on occasions be appropriate, and indeed on many occasions be highly appropriate to have an FAI. I just think that we're in the area of this tension that always exists between the discretion that's afforded the Lord Advocate, whether that's in relation to this matter or prosecution, the public interest versus, if you like, those closest to that, be the complainer in a criminal case or the family in a death. And there will be instances, and I can think of a very high-profile death that people would like, another one that would like a FAI, uh, and it's because the family don't wish it that it's not going to take place. So I just would the member acknowledge that there is that tension there, and that tension um, will exist and would be exacerbated by making it mandatory. Yes, I do understand the, t the tension, and I do fully understand the point uh, that John Finney's making on this, which is why I think... Actually, Neil Bibby's uh, conclusion uh, that it, it would be prudent to go away, reflect, bring it back to Parliament, having reflected on some of those points, uh, is a good one. And for that reason, uh, I shan't be pressing the amendment. Amendment 71A is withdrawn. Does any member object to it being withdrawn? No. Um, Neil Bibby, to press and withdraw Amendment 71. Uh, withdraw. Uh, amendment 71 is um, withdrawn. Does any member have any objections to that being withdrawn? No, it doesn't. I propose to include our consideration of stage two amendments here and we'll continue with the remainder of the stage two amendments next week. I thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for attending. Due to the time constraints, um, Agenda items four and five will be taken next, meet, uh, next week and I formally close this meeting of the Justice Committee.